Um, so, so yeah, here I am again. Uh, that's actually good because that I mean that'll be a nice beginner beginning uh, time to the stream. I might actually have to do that more regularly because it gives me a nice happy thing to, to pick up. We're three minutes in. I don't want to be too late. Um, I do want to save this up before I forget. Uh, fixed uh, Twitch start. Um, okay, and I'm assuming you can see me. If you cannot, let me know. Um, we're gonna go fast today as usual, uh, but it's fine. One of the things, uh, thank you, Clemento. Uh, yes, and um, okay, so I am now. I'm, I'm spending a little bit of time at looking at the chat, and then I'm going to stop looking at the chat, just like usual, otherwise I'll, I'll, it'll take me forever. But I just want to tell you about something that changed this morning, and I am not... Um, so I want to make sure you can see it. So let's go back to... Um, RWX, Rob. So rwx.gg uh, slash... There's now a new thing that I just started last night. You can go to week one. Uh, rwx.gg week one it'll take you straight to the calendar uh, or to the agenda for the week for the days and uh, I've simplified the days a little bit a um, bunch of stuff this is going to be changing all throughout the boost so just get used to it that's how things work it's how I can improve and you'll notice that on day two I chopped a lot of stuff in fact I don't have any terminal stuff. You guys did this diligently prepared for terminal stuff. The terminal stuff we're going to do on day three. So don't don't be mad. Um, I figured we'd have one more day in graphic land, basically. Uh, and then after that, we're going to be pretty much terminal all the time, every day. So uh, I figured I'd give you guys one more day of oxygen up in the graphics world um, while we talk about it just seemed to be the natural way to organize it so I pushed a lot of terminal stuff back uh, if you were diligent and you installed uh, WSL and Mac OS uh, the discord didn't work from yesterday you know what people have been saying that we're gonna have to look at that um, if somebody needs to post a new discord link um, okay it, I mean but it but it I, if you guys know where it's posted incorrectly I'll go ahead and fix it there uh, but I just want to let you know that, um, so, so day one, uh, has been, so if you guys want to go back to day one, uh, you can click on course languages here now and you get a summary of the course languages. So this is something that people have been asking for. Uh, I have this in conjunction with our playing around with Repolit yesterday where we kind of went overwent the languages. Uh, so that's really the only thing that changed the material from yesterday. Let me turn this music down a little bit. Um, so... Oh, really? Okay. Are you talking about at the top? Are you talking about here? Right here? Discord? So this Discord app should work. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look at that atrocity. How did that atrocity sneak in there? Who's in charge? Where's the quality control, people? Where's the quality control? I'm appalled. <laughs> so, I mean... Let me fix that. <laughs> so, because, you know, you guys understand, right? This is crazy. I don't even know why I'm doing this. Why am I doing this? I'm trying to do... Uh, it's really fun, though. 200 of them, poof it, poof it, no work. Fire them. <laughs> so, wait, where is it? Where is it? Assets. Yeah, whoopsie. I don't know, maybe this is... This is this is karma for all the bad energy I sent out to whoever it was who uh, authored the thing from try try what is it try hard coding <laughs> hacking what is it try hack me <laughs> um so here I have, I have to fix the uh, so it was in the join page right so yeah all right join try hard coding <laughs> that's <laughs> that's my where's the coffee. All right. By the way, this smells so good. I wish you could smell it. Smell. Sorry. Uh, we're, we got we got much less to do now than we did in like like twenty minutes ago. So I'm I'm confident we're gonna hit all of our bases. In fact, we're 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 basically crunched uh, an entire week uh, into this week. So because <laughs> I was looking at the time estimates, I was like, man, they they need more to do. So here we go. Uh, this fix is now. In the house, snozberries smell like snozberries. 
that's like my favorite movie in the world. It might just be my favorite movie. I'm going to be waiting for one week. No, 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 no. That's like... All right, so here we go. I heard... Um, I heard... Uh, um, let me just do this. I have to focus. Build, join. Yay. Uh, save, join. Discord. Typo. Fixed. Um, <laughs> we crunched an entire week into one week. Yes. Uh, into... Wait, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know... Hopefully you can hear between the lines what I'm trying to say here. Hopefully you can grok between the lines. By the way, do you guys... Okay, so this is actually important. This is actually important. I don't want to use this word until you guys know how to use it. But it's so much faster to type than understand. You need to install more coffee. <laughs> this is true. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to use the terminal just because... Yes, we crunched 24 hours into a full day. <laughs> into one day. How did we do it? Um, so, this is what I was trying to get at. Actually, I'm going to do this. Eh. Slash week one. Sudo apt get install coffee. You know, you don't need to get it anymore. Grokking means you've internalized the thing. Yes. Does anybody know where it came from? I actually need to write a little story. I didn't get time to do it, but I'm going to write one up. Uh, what Mosh said it means more than understanding. Rock is to understand at an intuitive level. Uh, so basically, this um, I added instead of understand uh, the terminal or understand the course overview and goals, I put grok the course overview and goals. I really am a fan of of verbs, uh, and frankly, I'm, I'm I'm actually killing two birds with one stone here because as I write the the days the days things. Uh, the exact writing is also going to be the language of the credential eventually. In other words, um, I, I'm missing grok here, but if I said grok open credentials, that would be a requirement, and that would mean you'd have to grok it, and you'd have to prove it, prove that you knew what an open credential was. If I said set up Brave or Chromium, you'd have to show me Brave or set up and see how you do it. So, so the, I'm I'm kind of happy of of how these how these 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 um daily breakdowns are taking place because they're they're turning into uh the checklist uh for you to know whether you know it so uh in fact um yeah, but can you grok corporate language oh that's a tough one um so grok is actually a word from uh i won't go down that that rabbit hole but if you don't know where the origin of grok wait until tomorrow because i'm going to make a whole page just on grok keep on grokking in the free world sigh all the wonderful references. All right, so grok the terminal approach. See what I'm saying? All right, so I just wanted to have that on there. So let, what is today's agenda? Um, so today, I just I just wanted to start with the keyboard and the mouse. We actually had some people asking in the chat, uh, in the Discord last night, about the keyboard and the mouse and stuff like that. What what we talk about. And they were asking me, they were asking me what um, keyboard I use and all that kind of stuff. So I just, I just want to jump really quickly into that. I don't want to spend a lot of time. We do have a, we're going to make a full web page today, uh, by the end of the day, uh, and we will have created a, a, a repo for code notes, and we'll have learned all of Markdown that you ever need to know to take notes by the end of the day. That's a lot to cover, so we're going to burn through this really fast. But I did want to just tell you a couple things about the keyboard and mouse um, that, uh, that that I just want to go through it really quickly. And and people ask me, well, what kind of keyboard do you use? Blah blah blah. Uh, what's my typing speed? Um, so so if we go to uh, keyboards, typing code, you can't do anything these days without being able to use a keyboard. The selection of a keyboard, however, is a very personal decision. Uh, so there's some discussion questions. What is the minimum typing speed you should work at as a technologist? Some people are 160 words a minute. Yeah, right. Uh, so you basically, you need to know how to type. And now that the you know the target age of the people that I'm speaking to here is 16, uh, that generally means that you already know how to type. Uh, if you don't know how to type, learn. <laughs> so, and you need to learn how to type from the home row. 
And that's all I'm going to say about that. This is you got plenty of hours to practice, so I want to give you some ideas about how you can practice and then move on. Um, uh, first of all, have you learned how to touch type? And I mean touch type. I, I still occasionally have to look at the the character keys that are above the numbers. I'll know that I've truly learned how to type when I don't have to look to type a percent sign, for example. Um, I'm super happy that I can now type a dash without looking. I can like my finger knows right where the dash is. Finally after 50 something years, you know, so don't hold your, I've also changed my opinion about typing. And this is a good topic of conversation for the chat. How important is typing to your ability to code? Uh, I have somebody who has told me that they don't need, think they need to type anything faster than 40 words a minute to be a good coder. And I was like, oh, no, no, man, you got to type at least 60 or 70 words. You can't be a good coder. And I actually have checked my opinion on that. I, I don't think you need to be a fast typer to be a good coder. I think you need to be able to process algorithms fast. In fact, you need a fast brain and not fast fingers and keyboard. Because if you, in fact, you might actually, uh, you, might, you might end up hurting yourself by typing stuff out too quickly. Um, unless you're a competitive, you know, uh, uh, hacker or a competitive coder. Um, that's, I don't think the typing speed is, is as important as I once did. So, so, so you can take that, you can digest that, uh, uh, the website for us. I'm, I'm 108. That was my, I, I peaked at 108 on nitro type. Uh, my average, my honest average, according to nitro type is about 75 words a minute. And, but that's because I write. And so let me just re 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 revise what I said about typing. Uh, I think you need to be a fast typer if you are a writer. And if you want to see my typing speed, if you really care that much, watch my random video last night uh, when I just was writing the whole entire night. I was just writing, writing, writing. I was getting ready for today. And so I think what I've done is I've projected my, you know, need to type faster uh, for writing onto coders. And coders, I don't think a coder particularly needs to know how to type really quickly. It's more important too that they know how to type weird characters. Like, so I'm just going to say this because people don't know it. I, I've, I've been in classrooms where they did not know where the semicolon was. They did not know what the bar was. Okay. So let me just, I'm not going to go through them all, but let me just mention them so that you can know to look for them. If you don't know what a back tick is, figure it out. If you don't know what a tilde is, figure it out. If you don't know what a backslash is, what's the difference between a backslash and a slash? Figure that out. What's a curly bracket? What's a bracket? What's a square bracket? What's an angle bracket? And we're going to talk, I have a page on brackets, by the way. So if you go to, and then um, what is a bar? Also known as the pipe sometimes. Uh, some people say bar, some people say pipe. It is a pipe in Unix because that's how it acts. Um, pipe operator. Um, you can give the, the, them symbols as well, yes. Um, and so, and then we have the star, otherwise known as the splat, you know, and I actually need to put these all on a page. I haven't, um, ampersand. What is the ampersand? What's the difference between the and sign and the ampersand? Um, what is the dollar sign? What is the hashtag? What's the true name of the hashtag? What is the true original name? This is something I learned last year. Somebody reminded me, they, they corrected me. They said, oh, you mean the, no, pound, pound sign. What's its what's its actual name? Nope. <laughs> Somebody's gonna Google it. <laughs> there it is, Octothorpe. Octothorpe. The sharp, the Howard hashtag. Okay. So the percent sign. These are all things you should know. Uh, the escape key. People don't even know where the escape key when I first uh, talk to them sometimes. Um, and while we're at it, I'll just tell you that the control uh, left bracket combination is physically different i suppose but it is the same uh signal to your computer it sends the escape signal okay so almost all keyboards instead of pressing escape you can push control left bracket everybody who learned that who had a mac did not sweat the fact that mac removed the escape key so um so i'm just that's all i'm going to say about keyboards right now uh, people ask me what kind of keyboard i have and i will confess right now that i use a mac keyboard for all my linux stuff uh this keyboard is the most efficient keyboard I've ever used. Yeah, I know. I knew you would be. I, 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 I got to tell you, it took a lot of, 
it took a lot of, 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 of um, soul searching for me to truly accept that the only Apple product in, in sight and the only white thing on my table is this Apple keyboard. And I finally just had to, I had to just put it aside and say, I am so fast on this keyboard. My hands just get as keyboard. And you know, it's funny. We watched the video last night with Linus Torvalds. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much, but Linus Torvalds, if you see his workspace, it has nothing in it, nothing in it. And he absolutely cannot stand any sound at all. He can't stand a CP fa fa uh, sound from his fan, from his keyboard, clickety clack, nothing like that. He's like really, really uh, sensitive to that. And that's why I like this keyboard. It's, it fits my hands well. It's just really fun. I, I would never in a thousand billion years use a mechanical keyboard. Um, I actually joke with people since we're on the topic of keyboards. I got your keyboard. There's your keyboard right there. How's that? How's that? Uh, uh. Yeah, that's my. That was my old keyboard, and we won't go down the keyboard craziness. But um, <laughs> is that a PS2 keyboard? <laughs> that's funny. Oh, <laughs> uh, because I get it. I get it. You people are funny. Um. So yeah, so that's 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 how I that's how I started. You talk about non-silent keys. Yeah, <laughs> I can write a bounty for John Wick. <laughs> you guys, I gotta focus here. Stop making great jokes. Um, you, if you have to know John, I'm a big, big, big John Wick fan. So yeah. Anyway, so that's how I learned. Uh, learned to type. Uh, you need to type for other reasons. Uh, RDBX slash Discord doesn't work. 404, did I break it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll fix it. Click on join. Click on join and that link works, Denny. Click on uh, join. So RWX.gg slash join and then there's a link that works. Thank you people for picking up my Slack. Um, okay, so enough, to, enough about typing. I just want to tell you a few places you can go where you can practice typing. Um, <laughs> and uh, so here we go. Uh, and I put these on this site. So this is rdbx.gg uh, slash typing. And uh, you can go to typing.com. This is the one I use to test people on. We're not going to go there right now. Z-Type, you may have seen me do on stream, is a really, really fun game. Uh, and if we have time today, you can play that. Uh, Nitro-Type, uh, I want to play that too. Uh, I'd actually like to open a Discord channel. Uh, I'll do this by the end of the day. But I want to open a Discord channel that just has typing in it. So people can like share information. Believe it or not, you know, typing is a big thing. People are really, really get into their keyboards, and it's kind of a fun place to like to pour to post like, for lack of a better word, you know, keyboard porn, uh, where people where people like show off their keyboards and stuff. So if you like to type, or if you're doing really great on Nitro Type, or you want to post your speed, or you're proud of it, or something like that, uh, I'm gonna make a, a a Discord channel uh, in the beginner boost area category just for typing. And if you wanna you wanna hook up with other people and do Nitro Type competitions, go for it. It's really addicting. It's really fun way to pass the time, and it's a good way to get some good skills. Um, and if somebody wants to make a true coder typing game, there's lots of them out there. Uh, that would be great too. We don't have, most of them are based on language. All right, so. Um, Word per minute measures your, your terminal speed. Ooh, that's interesting. Type, I, this is, oh, that's, I'm, this last one I haven't used very much. Somebody recommended it. This is an, a command line uh, typing speed test. So if you want to do that. Uh, could there be a hardware channel on Discord? That makes a lot of sense. Let's do that. It's getting pretty big. I didn't really mean for it to have that many categories, but I, I am happy to add a hardware category, actually. Um, then we could put all that stuff in there. How about that? Um, I mean, I don't know. You guys could, you guys have great, great, great suggestions there. All right. We have a half an hour left or so before I have to take my first break. Let me take a little bit of coffee and regroup. Uh, the only thing I want to talk about with a mouse is the importance of the three button mouse. And, and I don't want to understate how effective that can be. So by using a three button mouse, this is, um, so here's me using my mouse. I'm double clicking a thing. A lot of people, so first of all, people don't know to double click. I see people doing this all the time, right? When they could just double click a thing. You know what else you can do? Triple click. If you triple click, it picks the whole line. So double click, triple click, and 
you know, you can do the drag and drop if you want, but I, but I, it's almost always faster to double click or triple click because it, it already it bounds your thing and you don't, you know, accidentally miss the stuff on the end. People do that all the time. I see them do it constantly. Um, and so that's, that's something you can consider while you're doing your, um, while you're doing, thanks for the contribution. Um, so that's something you can do when you just want to pick something really fast. But here's something cool. If you middle click on Linux or Unix, you automatically paste. So this is, this is really great because this is one handed copy and pasting. This is how, copying and pasting as God, AKA Douglas Engelbart, the creator and original manufacturer of the mouse intended. And it took Apple to really screw us up. Apple came along and said, no, you, you forever need two hands to cut and paste. And because, because we want the mouse to look, we don't want three buttons on the mouse. That's like far too ugly. So they once again, f sacrificed function for form, which is Apple's way. And it just really triggers me because the whole world thinks that control C, control X and control V are the way to do things. And everybody, what does control C do on a, on a Unix system? What does what does what does control C do on a Unix system? It, it cancels stuff. So 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 and by the way, it cancels stuff way before Apple decided to do anything. You know what I'm saying? Uh see yeah, I'm using an Apple keyboard. I'm using an Apple keyboard, but it's but it's okay. So to be fair with Apple, Apple does make good crap when they don't. When they don't mess it up. Sometimes they mess it up. They make really high quality stuff. And if I could find this keyboard from any other manufacturer, I would instantly get it. But I haven't. I've looked everywhere, and there's a lot of manu there's lots of copiers cats, but they're none of them are exactly the same. They all have like clicky cat buffer butterfly keyboards. I hate those. All right. So anyway, the the cut and paste thing. So try this. Okay. Make sure you know how to do this. Even if you don't do it, at least know how to know about it. So double click, middle click, double click, middle click. Okay. That's the fastest way to cut and paste. If you insist on doing it the hard way by right clicking, you can usually do that. Alacrity is not set up for me to do that right now. But so let me just say that's that that is a Unix thing. Uh, it does not necessarily work that way um, in, in the terminal uh, that you have. And we'll we'll get to that when we talk about terminals tomorrow. Uh, but I just wanted to make you aware of your 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 mouse's your mouse, your Mises ability, um, because they, not a lot of people know that anyway. So that's, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, scroll in the middle. A lot of people scroll. I, I, I am not a fan of scrolling, although almost everything uh, is has scrolling built in. So you can scroll. Uh, the reason that I'm not a fan of scrolling is I can't be sure that scrolling is going to be something I have available to me. Um, and so when I get on another system, that's my primary thing. That's a very personal thing. I, I don't have anything against people who scroll. Plus, I, you know what? This is, this is going to sound really weird. I do not like scroll bars. Scroll bars freak me out. They're like, it's just that annoying thing, that unbalanced thing on the right of the screen that's, that's like always there and it's always just annoying me. It's like, I just want to go straight to the stuff. All right. So... Uh, wow, this double click thing is American. amazing. I can copy terminal output of a terminal emulator to somewhere like Firefox. You actually can do that. Um, and so you use, yeah, so watch. If I do try a knowledge base and I go back to here, I can put knowledge base there and it just pastes paste it right on, okay? You gotta remember that the next time you select something, it's gonna blow out that buffer. And I should probably mention that that buffer, the, the, the double click buffer or the triple, whatever, the middle click buffer is different from your desktop buffer. So I don't know, maybe somebody else there out there knows, but I believe that the, that the buffer, the middle click buffer that we're using is actually a thing that's built into X. I don't believe it's actually a factor of your window manager. So if you double click here, you can actually right click and this is a window manager way to cut and paste or whatever. And by the way, another reason that I don't necessarily like that is it's always inconsistent depending on the application, depending on the window manager you use, it's not there. But for some reason, you know, the middle click thing works on any X window that I've ever used. So I don't know that, by the way, that works on Solaris too, by the way, uh, you know, AIX, any other Unix system. It's been a part of the standard um, computer operating system desktop interface from the dawn of time and it took Apple to mess us up. Okay. So anyway, let's go back. Let's move on to something. I need to move a little faster on that. We got about 20 minutes left. Um, we got plenty of time though. Uh, do, 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 do. Where was I? Where's my other one? Okay, here we go. I'm going to exit this one and then I'm going to go back here. 
So the keyboard and the mouse, uh, the mouse, uh, yeah, sorry, we know, there's no mouse, 404. Um, it works in the CLI, you do we use the GP, okay, it is a CLI thing. Oh, 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 one last thing, uh, this is a terminal thing, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, if you ever have output, well, I, well, I'm giving you kind of an early one, so let's say you wanted to take the calendar output, right, and you want to you want to put it in your buffer, xclip, you can install xclip, and now um, I can back edit a file here and I can install, I can middle click and there it is. So you can actually script copies to your buffer. Just so you know, and that, may, that proves that it is an X thing. Um, so X clip is a thing. We'll talk more about that on terminal day. All right, so set up GitLab and GitHub. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not go through this. I'm just gonna, as we did with the ProtonMail stuff yesterday, uh, I'm just gonna say, you need GitLab and you need GitHub. Um, and so I have here for GitLab, I have the world's best Git hosting service. And I truly believe that. Uh, and if you really want all of the, the rundown, uh, I've written it here. Uh, it doesn't look like it's linked from here. Uh, but there is another, uh, there's another here, I'll go there. So if you go to, if you go to RVX, uh, choose dash GitLab, I didn't link it yet, but I need to. So choose GitLab over GitHub. Why both? We're going to talk about that. GitLab is the recommended Git hosting provider for this course. GitLab provides an objectively better service and gives back far more to the community than GitHub. All of us are, uh, are still required to have GitHub accounts to stay connected to the 10 million legacy users stuck on it, but use GitLab for most of your repos, public and private. That's my recommendation. Um, and it, it, I have a caption here that shows GitHub's objective superiority over GitHub. Um, yeah, GitHub is owned by Microsoft. So here is a bunch of comparisons. I don't want to run down them all right now. Uh, so GitLab accepts community contributions. It's a full CI CD DevOps. It has everything for free. Uh, it can be installed at home or on site. I mean, it's because you can have your own copy of it. You can't do that with GitHub. Uh, it's more likely for you to use on the job. GitHub is more likely for you to use is, is a hobbyist kind of thing. It has uh, multiple groups and subgroups, which can't be done on GitHub. That means you can organize your content much better. It has containerized repo projects. It has agile progressive architecture and it has new repos get pushed automatically. I think I'll show you that in tomorrow. But when you push, when you do a git push, it creates the repo. If it doesn't exist, does not do that on GitHub. Powerful import, exporting and mirroring. In other words, you GitLab, you can mirror your entire repo to GitHub without a problem just by adding a token and so github doesn't have anything for that uh has a cleaner view user interface i believe it has groups with projects get icons including animated gifs if you like that sort of thing in your project it has a powerful web ide which we're going to do today uh, it's a private company uh but it's got a very open core business model. In fact, they coined the term open core. The Harvard Business Review, uh, Harvard is doing a, bit, a Harvard Business Review on GitLab because of its forward thinking practices about being 100% remote, uh, working from home. It's just a phenomenal company. In fact, if you want to target a company to work for in this modern era, GitLab would be one of the first places I would apply. And I'm speaking about me personally, too. I love everything about that company that I know about it. Um, I love it has massive transparency, uh, including their business corporate meeting notes and everything. As a very, very clean business history, they had one hiccup where they were trying to make their code of conduct say, uh, they were basically saying, hey, look, we're not going to get involved with the political questions about whether someone should host here or not. GitHub got, you know, doubled down on that. We're not going to talk about that, but... Other than that, it's pretty clean. Uh, GitHub has had ma multiple harassment scandals uh, that have rocked its history for a very long time. That GitHub, GitHub had to be saved. Despite all of its success and all of its users, it had to be saved and was near bankruptcy when Microsoft bought it for, was it $7.2 billion, I think? Which was really wise on Microsoft's part. Uh, they promote they promote the work from home uh, system. They have uh, all of those things. And there's eight so so there's eight hundred thousand uh, users on Git. Better users I put on GitLab, and there's ten million legacy users on, on that. And I just like the logo better. <laughs> so let me just say this: the 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 people say, well, if you want um, what's the word um, findability, discoverability, uh, you need to be on GitHub. And I agree, you do need to be on GitHub, but um, your stuff can be mirrored 
on GitHub from GitLab and you can automatically mirror it there so that all your best content of your portfolio will still show up in searches. In fact, GitLab's, GitLab's own source code is mirrored to GitHub. Um, I actually said somebody confusing confused that that was the original and they mentioned it to me the other day like hey did you know GitLab is hosted on GitHub and I said no it's not and I then I went and checked it last night and it turns out it's they're using their mirroring uh, thing where it says the actual canonical source for this stuff is over here but the thing that's really great about that is you don't have to lose discoverability uh, better logo sold <laughs> yeah so so that's that's why all right um, and, and you really do need to have both, but I suggest that you set up both. If, if you if you look at mine, it's a disaster because I have got so much crap out there. I have hundreds of repos that I need to clean up. It's like the equivalent of, you know, like, uh, your desk. <laughs> it's got every little, you know, quick start. Uh, and, and probably the biggest thing, in fact, very recently, uh, GitHub added, uh, free private teams, whatever that means, repos. Uh, so to, how do you open tickets? Please don't open ticket on my system just yet, unless you have a problem. Uh, if you need to open tickets against my stuff, are you talking about opening tickets against my stuff? Uh, we're, we're actually going to practice how to open a ticket and that kind of thing. I don't know if we're going to get that done today, uh, but that's definitely a task you should should learn how to do. And if you want to practice opening tickets, um, so yeah, let me let me show you how to open a ticket on my stuff. Uh, first of all, though, we need to make sure that everybody has a GitLab repo. Uh, set up mirroring by default when you create a repo. Uh, no, but I would love it if you could do that. Uh, you do. Um, you once you get the token. Uh, however, once you 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 put the token from GitHub into your GitLab tokens, um, all you have to do is is click on a few things. And I actually have been I have been working on automating that setting so that you can do it from the command line. I have a command I've been working on for a long time called repo. Uh, which I recently completely gutted and started to use something called GraphQL, uh, which is a web interface to control an application from other ways. Um, uh, I won't be returning to working on my repo command until the boost is finished, which is going to push us out another four months. Uh, but that is probably one of my biggest um, things that I need to finish um, eventually because it, managing the two things together. There, by the way, that's a really great idea if somebody else wants to start a project. So if you... Uh, a feature request, yes. If you guys want to, you can even make it. GitLab last year had over 4,000 contributions from the open source community. Um, repo, R-E-P-O, as, as in repository. So uh, that's probably a good thing to talk about. So uh, Git repos uh, are what this is all built on. Uh, Git, Git is a, uh, and you can go read about Git at the, um, I, don't, I don't, do I have a link on Git? I don't think I do. Let me check. But Git, Git, itself is a source manager. Nope, I don't need one. That was too bad. All right, so we're gonna go to Git SCM source code management. And you can actually download uh, Git from here. This has a, a pretty uh, watch your eyes. Sorry, but um, so this is Git. This is Git SCM. This is a this is a what's called a source control uh, management system. Uh, so it lets you store your code, uh, your anything written, really. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to do this today um, in a way that, that is decentralized so that anybody can become the master uh, if one of them goes down. And uh, the history of Git is is that um, Linus Torvalds, who made Linux, was like, you know, this really isn't working, all the other ones. And so he made a new one. And it became a worldwide success. Uh, some people still criticize it for its complexity, um, uh, as in Git. Uh, there, there's no role in Git. You just, yeah. If you're if you if you're Git, if you're using Git, uh, you're just any anyone who is using Git is using it to manage source. And source can be just plain old words. And today we're going to write notes and we're going to call that source code, uh, as opposed to just you know source actual source code like you would use for Linux. Um, uh, <laughs> the, probably the, the, the biggest advantage of this is that any, any copy of a repo is a fully working copy. And for some reason, I mean, I agree with Linus on this, every other source management system to date up to, the, up to Git did not have that. It had this idea of this monolithic approach, like there was only one master. And if that master got corrupt, God help you. And it did. SVN, CVS, they would get messed up and then you're done. 
you're done. You had no way to manage your versions. You have to like revert and use the code you had. Whereas when you're talking about uh, Git management uh, here, and we're not going to, by the way, we're not going to get into the weeds on Git uh, at most tomorrow. We're going to write um, a, a command line script uh, for you to use call, that we'll call save or whatever you want. And it will actually do the Git commands for you uh, to, to publish or to push or to whatever they call it to push the the changes. I'm trying to keep the words simple here and not use, you know, you know, tech speak too much. But but that's that's the point. Uh at the end of the day, uh for most people, Git and GitHub and GitLab are just a great way to back up your code. Uh in a way that you can see each version and each change that it was ever made. If you do it with other people, awesome. All right. Uh no, we're going to rock GitLab now. That's what we're going to do right now, my friends. So so that is what GitLab is. So GitLab is we're gonna you're talking about grokking GitLab from the command line is tomorrow. All right, so we're gonna do all of the all of the wonderful like graphic stuff is today, and tomorrow we're gonna do the command line stuff for Git and GitLab, setting up the keys and if you know what I'm talking about, we're gonna do all that tomorrow. But today I just want to let you guys experiment. I kind of wanted to show you what to do here. Uh, we are not going to get into branches at all, other than to tell you that when you're using the editor, avoid anything but the master branch. Uh, people will like draw and quarter me for saying that, but the fact of the matter is, is that most Git development is not does not require branching, and in fact, I have learned to avoid branches entirely uh, by being because branches. You guys don't know what branches are, but Branches can really, really complicate your code. And there's people who are like really, really hardcore Git people. Uh, yeah, who who think that everything should be, you know, all branched out. And what a branch is, guys, is it's a way for you to, to take your main code, you know, version and branch it out and give it a name and then do other things experimentally to it. And then hopefully nothing has changed up here to render it incompatible. And then you kind of merge them back in together. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people think that branching is really important, uh, and they use it a lot. And I don't. I, I don't. Um, uh, if you, <laughs> if branches, um, I, branches are a good way to experiment with the code. Um, but yeah, but but there and and there are lots and lots of tools to help you visualize. Uh, this very complex source management tool or version can yeah uh, it's SCM so that would be source control uh, source control management I think so um, version control is what it used to be called so CVS did I get that right was source control was that was the source control and then the, the git is is more about now branching is only an option when you are working on your own uh, when you have a team of people working branches are a necessity. I completely agree with that, but we are not there. So, so um, it, most of the time when you're working with a team of people, uh, it, unless you have commit access to the source code repo, you're not going to be branching. You're going to be sending pull requests. And so what I would rather have people learn is how to make a pull request. Uh, the difference between branching and pull requests is that in one case, a pull request is here's my changes i suggest that you add them and then they can approve the changes and they'll get merged in uh, whereas a branch uh, i have 14 branches for my text file my tigger right if you're working on a team how would you not use branching uh, i can't have everyone push to master uh, you would use you if you're working on a team and you're using git in that sense you can try to use branches and like have different that's fine if you want to start using it that way but not a 16 year old beginner they don't know how they don't need to know that level of functionality okay right now they just want to know how to use git okay uh, and and uh, uh, merge requests well okay pull requests is what they call them on github and merge requests are what they're called on GitLab. all right so um, so I completely agree that there are better uses for git but they do not fit the scope of just getting started so that you know what git is all right. So in order to um, to get get GitLab, um, so guys, go ahead and make GitLab. Get an account over here if you haven't. Uh, again, I suggest you use your ProtonMail account if you have one. It's rather than Gmail for this kind of thing. Um, you can spend as much time you want on your own profile. 
uh, you can set your own status. Can I can I just give you one tip though? Um, so and then we're gonna get ready. I'm gonna take a break here in three minutes, and we'll start making a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so uh, get see how my name over here on GitLab, and some people might disagree with this. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of GitLab is also not supported for individuals. Uh, so you'll see my username over here is underscore RWX Rob. And the reason for that is because sub projects, subgroups, subgroups in order to group your projects and people who knew GitHub don't even have any concept of this because they can't do it. But you can actually add subgroups and put projects and other groups under those things, just like a proper directory structure. And But you can only do it if you have a group. You can't do it on your individual account. So your individual account is forced to behave like GitHub's flattened structure where you only get one project at the top and then you end up with hundreds of projects in a way that is not... There's no such thing as a free trial. It's all free. You just have to get skipped past all of that stuff. Um, and so, so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you want, uh, I suggest maybe making underscore something, making your individual account, like downplaying your individual account and not even using it that much and then creating a group account. So here's, here's my group account, um, and create, creating, creating a group under your individual that's owned by your individual that is your name. Okay. And then if that's your name, then you can do things like this. You see my configurations are grouped. Um, you know, common Linux mint configurations. Um, and you can do stuff like that. That actually shouldn't be like that, but whatever. My point is, is that you can make subgroups like subfolders. Uh, I wouldn't, yeah, get love gold. You don't need any of that. They're going to try to get you on that, but they, you don't need to do any of that. They gotten a little bit, uh, worse at that. They didn't used to be so in your face about that. So here's one of the things that I really love about GitLab. So GitLab lets you have multiple groups for free. You can have subgroups, you can have private groups. There's no money involved. GitHub still charges for that, even though they expanded what's free there. Um, so, so let's see here, guys. So just go ahead and create, uh, create your account. And the next thing you should do is create a group. Okay, so you click on groups and click on your groups and then you got new group over here, right? And I would create a group and I would use the group as your primary thing instead of your individual account. So in my case, my group is RWX Rob and that allows me to use uh, subdirectories under it. Uh, you can have multiple groups for free, as I said, and they can be private. Uh, and as, as you can see, I've got, uh, I've got another group here for RWX GG. Uh, this is a group. This is where the readme is here. Uh, so they have the concept of projects, which are repos on GitHub, and groups, which are organizations or teams on on uh, on GitHub. And then you can you can organize things based on that. One of the great things about this, though, is that when you look at somebody's profile, and I hated this about GitHub, uh, when you look at somebody's profile, you get to see all of their groups by default. You can click on the groups that they own and operate that they're in charge of. And they're not a separate entity. On GitHub, an organization is a standalone account entry. And the only association it has with an individual is something called the billing address. And it has an email address to which it will be billed for any money or something like that. Uh, GitLab, uh, to the contrary, is built fundamentally based on the idea that any group is owned by an individual. So the, you can transfer groups between individuals, but any group is, is built uh, around this, this assumption. So then you can go automatically see, well, what anything has been public, you can see which, which ones are there. All right, I'm going to take a break for uh, for 15 minutes. So we'll be, I'll be back at 12:10. Uh, let me just give you the um, uh, how how can you mirror for discoverability? That's a good question. If you're going to do subgroups, you can mirror and you can translate uh, you can translate the mirror into dashes if you wish to do so. And I've done that. I I, I have mixed feelings on subgroups because of that incompatibility. Uh, but but it does they don't. It doesn't matter what your organization is. You're not automating the, the mapping. So a lot of times, like for example, I'll, ha for, I'll have something under RWX or GG or whatever. And then I'll, if I mirror it, it would be RWX GG dash whatever. And then that would be, that would be the mirrored name. So the, so the, the subgroups would be built into the single name, which is what, how people get around the problem on GitHub already today. So groups are like, uh, no projects, groups are, like directories. Think of groups like directories. 
they're 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 ways for you to put stuff in and think of projects like the files that go into those directories and so that's largely what it's what it's like okay so yeah just play around with it a little bit i'm gonna go i need to take about 10 minutes i'll be back at, at 12 10 and i'll turn the music back up uh but it would be great if you could have a git love git lab account created for sure uh and if you need to add uh, if you haven't got a GitHub account yet, go ahead and spend some time to add one of those as well. Um, I, I strongly recommend that you synchronize the names as much as possible and, you know, consider using an individual name uh, that is not your actual name you want to use on GitLab so that your group name can be used for that. That's what I'm doing here. And when we come back, we're going to go ahead and start. We're going to look on day two. Where's my rest of my day two here? Uh, turn this back up. Yeah, and then um, so week one, day two. So after this, we're going to play around with the GitLab editor. We're going to learn some markdown in the next segment. We're going to do the editor to learn markdown in the next segment. And uh, we're going to uh, create a, our code book, and that's what we're going to do. And then uh, in the last segment, we will do some web development. So very basic web development. All right, guys, talk to you soon. I, there's no, okay, on the YouTube thing, the YouTube, I can't, I'll publish yesterday's video at the end of today because it has to be 24 hours before I can post according to the affiliate terms for Twitch.
Ah. All right. What's the point of having both? Let's answer that question. Um, GitLab is, I think, is is better to use, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. The whole GNOME project does. ESR, a bunch of, a bunch of really significant projects um, use GitLab, uh, but everybody else uses GitHub. I mean, like everybody else, and that's why. Hey, uh, and that is that's actually why I think you need both. You cannot, for example. Um, you can't contribute to a GitHub project or open an issue on a GitHub project without a GitHub account. Uh, you also can't mirror your GitLab content to GitHub if you need to. Yeah, GitHub has the publicity and the discoverability, uh, but it is not necessarily the best. So, and you know, and if you want to just use GitHub too, that's fine. You'll just be one of the other 10 million people who do. And I, I'm not against that at all. If that's your choice, I, one of the greatest conflicts I've had, it's all over in my blog, is whether I should suggest GitHub or GitLab as a primary. And the truth is, you need both. You need both. Uh, there's a bunch of other Git sources, uh, Git hosting services out there too, by the way, that I will not go into right now. I'll let you kind of find them on your own. Uh, source that comes to mind. Uh, which is a very terminal friendly uh, thing. Uh, but if you're a hobbyist, I don't think you need much more than GitLab. Um, you can't, part of the problem about putting your, there's Bitbucket, yep. Uh, we're, we're not, no, I don't recommend learning Java. Uh, at least not when you start. So, uh, all right, we're going to go back on the, uh, back on the, on the agenda for today. Uh, and we'll, we're going to move on from that. Uh, GitHub when you want discoverability, yes. Okay, so we have, where are we? We're on, so Markdown and GitLab Editor. Okay, so assuming you all have a GitLab account now, I'm going to introduce you to, to one of the biggest advantages of GitLab, which is not a, a huge thing, but I, I think it's significant enough to, to talk about. So um, uh, I'm going to actually encourage you guys to go out here and make a repo. I'm going to do it with you. Uh, so I'm on target <laughs> zeros and we are now going to make a project. Uh, so I'm going to make a new project. Um, I, my, I have a dark mode on, I apologize, but it's, it's just a little bit easier to read. Um, so I'm going to make a project. Okay. And let's call this project code book. All right. And I'm going to, we're going to talk about our notes. Call it whatever you want. You call it notes, but what this this project is is a place for you to take notes, take free to write. And I, I like calling it a code book because I can like kind of put you know my code in there. But but if let's just call it notes if you want, just call it notes. And it depends on what you want to do with the notes, right? So do you want to share them? So then you have to pick well what is going to be the if you have multiple groups, you might not have a group yet. But if you do add a group, you have to pick which group for it to go under. Now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it under my RWX Rob group, uh, which is under the um, the underscore RWX Rob individual. Thanks. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, we've got GitLab slash RWX Rob, and we have a project slug. A slug is a term from the publishing industry, which means that's how you're going to find the thing. It's usually got dashes in it. And you can click on slug and do that. Now you can put something here if you want to. You don't really need it. And I suggest just keeping it private. Um, eventually, I'll show you someday how to do this from the command line. You don't even need to do all of this. Um, but but for right now, let's do it through the GUI. So then we do here. We go click on create project. And then what? Now we have a new project that's empty. Uh, we can clone. You can actually clone projects to, from GitHub into your GitLab pretty easily. Uh, but that's not what we're going to do right now. Right now, we're just trying to make some notes. And I want to show you how uh, you can actually edit those notes without leaving GitLab. All right. Um, oh, thank you, guys. So, so here we have a new file. All right. So, and there's readme's, licenses, all this really great stuff. If you've used GitHub before, oh wow, thanks for the subs. Um, you will notice that uh, 
there, there are a lot more little helpers going on here in GitLab, and that's actually kind of nice. So um, I'm going to go ahead and click on new file, um, and I'm going to make a file. So again, I did not have to do any of the complicated stuff that you normally have to do uh, when, <laughs> thanks guys, uh, when you have to pull stuff in. So, so here I have a new file. Uh, and I'm going very slowly here because I don't want to leave anybody in the dust. You can actually select a different template type, all that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> thanks. And then we're going to go ahead and, and create a file name. Now, in this case, I'm going to create a file named called readme.md. And the reason I'm doing that is because readme.md is the default uh, name for notes and readmes both on github and gitlab and i believe the world in fact if you want to learn more about that i'm creating a project called readme world which is basically the collection of all the readmes out there that people want to share um and so guis are slow yes that's tomorrow we're going to do it for tomorrow um so master readme.md and uh make sure you put your your title in there and then we're going to go to the bottom, scroll down, and go ahead and click on Commit Changes. And this is equivalent of Save. Uh, Get purists are really going to come unglued to a lot of the things that I say here, but I don't care. I'm talking to the beginners. Uh, so click on Commit Changes. Um, uh, now, all caps are readme.md. It's very important you do all caps readme.md. Um, so, so that's, that's what I'm asking you to put here. Okay. So stick with me. Uh, now down here, you can actually go ahead. Whoops. I don't know if you can see that because it's kind of covered by my head, but if you can't here, I'll move. Am I out of the way? So you click on, find the edit button. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'm going to create a new directory to leave. Why? Um, so, so here we're going to click on edit and, uh, and then from the edit, we can go ahead and uh, type some stuff in here. And what are we going to type in here, right? Uh, well, let's just type something simple. So um, let's let's just say I don't know uh, my notes, uh, my notes, right? Okay, you guys see that? Oh boy, I'll stick right there. So my notes. Okay, so your first uh, markdown is the hashtag. Hashtag turns uh, a markdown into uh, into a um, just a regular line into a header header one and so so there we go uh, and <laughs> so here we go so readme.md my notes uh, it's nothing fancy here and then down here we click on commit again this is where get purists will really come unglued because like you're gonna do one commit just for one line in your notes file and I'm like yes I am it's just a notes repo dude chill out um, so here we see that the, the notes are showing up and we get a header and it gets rendered. Um, I don't dare turn my dark mode off for you. It probably hurts you. Um, but you see the point you get automatic rendering of your notes and believe it or not, you can actually eventually link notes like this directly without turning them into web pages. It's so easy to make them a web page that, that you probably want to just stick with the web page, but, but it's not that bad to have a notes file and markdown right here that will be rendered okay so what i actually wanted to show you right now is the web id so that what we use is we use the simple editor with the edit button which i think i'm is my head over it edit can you see it and um the uh this is not unlike the github one uh so the github one is is edit and then uh the next one is web id it's right next to it here um, and that, I haven't seen that one. Display rendered file. That's a new one. I haven't, I haven't seen that one. Has it always been there? I guess it is. Oh, it is. That's the one we're on right now. Okay. If you want to see the source code, I guess you can click here and see the source. Oh, that's cool. Okay. I didn't see that before. Anyway, so we're going to click on web IDE and this is where it can get, normally you just find using the edit tool and it's faster to be honest. Uh, Yes, I've got. Do you, guys, do you guys really want to see the non-dark mode? Okay, cover your eyes. <laughs> cover your eyes. Here's here's what it looks like without dark mode. Uh, I, I I believe there is a dark mode for the editor, but I do not believe there's a dark mode for the entire interface to GitLab. So I have I have dark mode in, uh, enabled. Hmm. Okay, so 
when you click on edit, uh, you want all the information, whatever. Um, the Google's, the Google's do, not, the goggles do nothing. So let's click on Web IDE while we have it in in this blinding white mode for a second, so you can see what's going on. Uh, we're gonna click on Web IDE, and oh, I forgot about this. So I do have dark mode for the Web IDE, so I forgot about that. You can set dark mode for the web IDE, uh, the keyboard, uh, and then, uh, so, so now we have the same my notes thing here, but here's something cool. Look at this. So you can click on edit and you can click on preview and you can see what your notes are going to look like while you're writing them. Okay. Uh, and, and once again, I know there's other editors, there's lots of other ways to do this, but if you're just starting out, this is pretty convenient, you know, not to mention the fact that you can do it from anywhere. Right, you can actually edit your GitLab stuff anywhere, and that includes source code, uh, anything, and you can commit it right here and save it that way. If you're if you're brave, um, you know, of course you would never do that with production code. But if but if you were working on a project and you just wanted to tweak it, or if it's just notes, uh, this is one way to do that. Another another big advantage of of the web editor is I can upload files. So we're not going to do it right now, but just so you know, uh, you can click on upload file. And you can go to your system and find a picture and upload that picture and then include it and save it and it will go, it will go here. Okay. Um, you can upload pictures in GitHub as well uh, using their editor, but this, this editor is a little bit more reminiscent of VS Code or what you might ex experience with a, a visual editor uh, if you are using a visual editor of some kind. So again, tomorrow is all about the terminal, so stay with me. Uh, but but thanks for that uh, showing us where that theme is um so if you're on yeah if you're working on another friend's computer and you just want to you found something you need to tweak uh, or really if you're if you're working with really young beginners uh by the way i should mention that gitlab one of the reasons for gitlab is that their policy on people under 13 using it is is softer and if necessary you can write your you can start your own gitlab server so i actually worked with people as young as nine before and github has very very strict terms about people under 13 and about sharing accounts which means that parents can't create an account and use it with their children it's very very explicitly written in the github policy and that's a big deal when you're dealing with young people so just a side note um so we have the preview mark done over here and you can do all this so I think we're about ready to, to jump into Markdown and how to use it and what it's about uh, and, and how to publish it. So the last segment, this is during this segment, all we're going to do is learn Markdown and practice editing notes using the editor um, and previewing it so you can see what it looks like. Okay, that's it. That's all we're going to do for the next segment pretty much. Um, after that, we're going to show you how to take these notes and go the next step and make a new repo, uh, make a new group or project, whatever you want to call it, make it that, that has an actual website in it. And I want to show you how easy it is to publish a, a website uh, to a service called Netlify. And that will be the second segment coming up um, later. Um, so, so here we go. Let's do some markdown. So the thing I'm about to refer to is all covered under uh, rwx.gg slash markdown. And anytime we start talking about Markdown, those who know about Markdown have tons of opinions about what editor to use and what syntax to use and how to compile it and render it and whether you should use it or not and how how their favorite uh, Markdown tool or you know works better than another one. I, you know what? Those are all fantastic things for you to consider, and I encourage you to get a, you know a breadth of information about this and do your own research. Uh, but I'm going to kind of cut to the chase and get to what I recommend and why. So the the first thing you need to do is understand what Markdown is. Grok Markdown, right? Markdown is a tool that was is a is a is a syntax for writing that was invented by writers, not scientists. Um, and so Markdown is a simple markup language. Markup, by the way, guys, what's markup? Markup is writing that is marked up for formatting symbols and syntax. HTML is an example of markup language. So is Markdown. Um, so that's what markup is. Markdown was a play on the word because it was made by John Gruber and Aaron Schwartz uh, from Reddit fame. He was one of the co-creators of Reddit. And they were podcasters and writers, and they're like, you know what? This HTML sucks, man. I hate writing this stuff. And so they created a language based on a bunch of text um sort of you know formats that were being used for people to make documents that existed only as text you know and then they said well what if we just wrote this little Perl script to convert it and to this day uh you can go find the original markdown 
which will probably pull up first hit. Uh, Daring Fireball. There it is. Uh, and this we've since come a long way from this. You should probably not follow this for anything. Uh, but this is the original. It's still there. He's still podcast, by the way. Um, and you can still go get the Pearl script if you want it. So that is the original Markdown. He's chosen not to, uh, just to give you a quick background on that, he um, has not been actively engaged in any of the work uh, to standardize Markdown since that time, uh, which has left the mantle pretty much on Pandoc's creator, um, JGM, uh, who created, uh, and, and he didn't create, but he's kind of spearheaded the effort for something called Common Mark, uh, which was a movement toward to standardize Markdown because under with no direction, Markdown got really fractured really fast. And so that's why the, the rest of today, I'm going to show you about something I call simplified Markdown, easy mark or basic Markdown. And uh, at one point I called it base ML. Um, and the reason for this is because if you know the basics, which you can learn in 10, 20 minutes, you don't need to stress the details about all of the extra power you can add. Uh, you can add those later, okay? Um, but you just need to know basic markdown. Why do you need to learn markdown? Because markdown is used everywhere. People write their notes in markdown, people make books in markdown, people read it, Stack Exchange, Discord, all of them support markdown in some form. Slack doesn't, by the way just saying um so there's a lot there's lots of reasons to learn markdown i believe it's actually one of the most important if not the most important language that is not taught anywhere it's not taught in schools or anywhere because it's the language of knowledge it's the syntax of knowledge source and um uh, we're kind of cramming the knowledge source conversation uh which is i think uh it was originally it had its own week uh, into this week, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to you know get through this really quickly. Uh, okay, so here we go. Standard knowledge based source language. Markdown has become the closest thing to a universal standard for writing all documentation today. In addition, authors can write textbooks and novels in Markdown. And when combined with a tool like Pandoc, your Markdown can be converted to every other format on the planet. Markdown is the only markup writing language that can claim this. Therefore, everyone should learn it from those needing a solid, sustainable way to take notes to those creating entire knowledge bases. Ironically, Markdown is practically not taught today. Pretty much everything I said. Uh, if you want to know, well, why not Wikipedia or Wiki? Uh, you can read about that. I don't want to debate that right now because I want to get through the Markdown stuff. Uh, suffice it to say that wikis uh, address an entirely different need and are still far too technical for the average person to use. So here we go. Types of Markdown. Eventually, you'll want to use Pandoc Markdown for everything. In fact, this document is written in it. Um, you can like click on, you've been seeing me edit Markdown last night, the entire video during the night. If you want to see me editing Markdown, just watch that. Uh, Pandoc Markdown is far and away the most powerful, sustainable, and supported format for capturing knowledge source, which is why the R language uh, project adopted it as their language documentation format. However, learning basic Pandoc takes less than 30 minutes and it will work everywhere. What are the differences? Well, we have basic Markdown, which I just talked about. We have Common Mark, which was this effort from JGM and the gang to bring GitHub flavored Markdown, which is a disaster. Uh, there's a few good things that came from that, but most of them are just horrible. And they brought them, brought them together and say, hey, we need to agree on something here because everybody's going in different directions. And then you have Pandoc Markdown, which was with JGM, uh, you know, giving himself uh, license to say, no, this is the most effective, most, my idea of what the most centralized markdown should be. And dude, he nailed it. I mean, he really nailed it. Congratulations. I mean, everything from how simple tables are to everything else. And so the, the, the markdown that I'm telling you is the first step in your knowledge of markdown. You can kind of build on it. Um, and then you can come, you can start to write entire knowledge bases in Pandoc markdown, if not books, um, if you want to grow into that to that level, including references and blah, blah, blah. But basic markdown. So let's do basic markdown. And if you have, uh, uh, if you guys, if you guys have um, your editor open, then you can practice with this. And I'm going to actually do this a little bit right now. So the first thing we have are paragraphs. Okay. So paragraphs are just long single lines that are followed by a blank line. That's it. Um, so we already kind of did headers first, but let's go do a paragraph. Oh, that's right. I'm going to have to go back over here. Whoops. I screwed up. Here you guys. You're still there. There you go. So in paragraph. So let's do a paragraph. Um, this is a paragraph. I'm going to have to go fast here. Okay. And, and, and by the way, when you do paragraphs, just use one line. You know what else is a paragraph? This. 
Okay, Markdown accepts that as a paragraph, but that's a super bad idea. Don't do that because this, if you have modern editors will wrap properly if you make it one single long line, as an example here. If you don't do that, you get this and you try to re resize your Tmux paint and you get this horrible disaster of, of wrapping. So just make your paragraphs one single long line and you'll live a happy long life, <laughs> okay? Don't mess with this 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 ability to like put them on. That was because a lot of times they were reading text emails. One of the things that I disagree with with the, with the original Rep Markdown founders is that you should have artistic flexibility in how you, you, you represent yourself in your code. And that is the opposite of, of efficiency. Um, you know, you don't want more than one way. It's why Python 1 over Perl, you want one best way uh, to do something. And, and in my case, I think there's one best way to do paragraphs so that they wrap properly, and that is one big long line. All right, so there's a paragraph. Uh, here, here is another paragraph. Okay. Uh, and then, so that's a paragraph. And you can preview it here. Click on the preview. Hey, look, we got two paragraphs, right? If I, if you actually, I'll, let me just show you. Um, it, it, it would, technically, that is a paragraph, but just don't do that. Make sure there's one line. Um, it's a little bit harder to navigate with VI, but that's fine. You're going to be okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, okay, and what else we got? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. And then we have... Uh, yeah, if you have an editor that doesn't wrap, you actually Notepad is fine. You just have to click on Wrap in Notepad. You just have to activate and wrapping. Uh, so here, here's what we got. One okay. So formatting, one star for italics. I'm actually just going to let you do these things. I'm going to go through them. We're not going to make it. Uh, okay. So one star for italics. You can actually use underscores and a whole bunch of other things. Forget it. Just use one star for italics. All right. For bold, two stars for bold. Okay. You get bold. Uh, for bold italics, you get three stars for bold italics. Okay, three stars for bold italics. Dot markdown. Dot MD is markdown. Yes. Um, for monospace code that looks like it's code backticks, which is the the key above the tab key on an American keyboard. Um, don't use the underscores. Just don't be tempted. They're not even supported in other versions. They cause problems. Uh, try not to overlap your formats. So. If you have bold inside of an italic, you can do that with Pandog, but just try not to do that. It can get really messy um, if you can help it. Uh, headings. Let's do headings real fast. So headings. Um, uh, here's a heading. So a heading, as you see, is just a hashtag. Level one paragraphs are here. Level two paragraph here. Um, and uh, that's it. Okay. And there's a couple of rules here. Please, please try to only keep one level one heading, and that's for SEO. Uh, you should really only use one level one heading and, and when you get into it you'll start to use when you start to use front matter you won't even use a level one heading at all your first level you'll have lots of level two headings um, uh, okay so so here we go uh, formatting is allowed in headings uh, I think I just talked about that. Uh, sometimes formatting and headings can be problematic depending on what kind of renderer you're using. Uh, I don't mind. I, I, I use formatting in my headers pretty frequently these days. Uh, but although I used to have a different opinion on that. So this, just, be, just be aware of that depending on where you're using it. Uh, hyperlinks. If you want maximum compatibility, don't put, don't put formatting in your header. Uh, that means like italics and stuff. Links and hyperlinks. Uh, so how do you link on things, right? Uh, the most common link in Markdown is just words you can click on. By the way, um, on rdbx.gg, these little these little uh, gimes are to show you an external link that goes out to something on the internet, uh, whereas underscore is just a link to something locally. Uh, that's a convention I really like to follow in my writing. Uh, I like to give people, I used to have a little globe symbol there, but I like to give people visual indications that they are going to go leave my site. Uh, and because I know I, I I'm I'm kind of annoyed that people don't tell me uh, when you click on things and you it takes you completely out you know and and you go you go someplace else um, uh, so so yeah uh, anyway um, here we go so so here's how you do a link uh, this is a little bit more complicated um, uh, so here is a link so a link is just square brackets right uh followed immediately uh in fact this is how it's identified I was, if you look at the code it looks for this combination that's what identifies a real link uh so it looks for a bracket but it looks for this bracket and this parentheses combination and and then uh it it puts the um url here 
and then you have the parenthesis here. Now, technically speaking, you can put some other text after that. Don't, just don't do it. Don't complicate your life. Just keep it simple and easy to read because you're going to be editing it a lot. And by the way, Markdown also allows you to do another format where you can put the reference at the bottom of the page. And that is the stupidest thing that Markdown has allows. I think, I think it's the dumbest thing short of like multiple, because why would you ever do that when you're going to cut and paste, when you're going to cut and paste your, your paragraphs that have links in them into other documents? What happens to all the dangling references at the bottom of your document? They're completely orphaned and you don't even know. So just hear me out on this. Do not ever separate your links from their links material, their actual hyperlink. If you do, it allows for it, but just do not do it. If, I mean, it will look pretty, but it, but if you have a modern editor, I don't know if you guys saw, but if you have a modern editor, who cares? Because it's going to hide it anyway. I mean, we're talking about even Vim hides this. Okay, so like, look, see me here. I'm editing, let's see. So here, I'm going to edit readme file here, right? Oops, wrong one. Let's do a better one. Let's do like uh, markup. All right, so markup. We'll do markdown. So here's my markdown file that I'm editing, right? See this link right here? Not too bad, right? But even the long ones aren't that bad. And they are, this one's not being hidden. I got my hiding turned off right now, darn it. I can't prove it to you. But you can turn um, conceal on so that when you leave the paragraph, uh, this big, long, horrendous link uh, is not displayed. But if you have a good syntax hider, who cares? You know, it's fine. It's not going to hurt anybody to have it there. Uh, and you don't need that level of artistic expression. So what you're sacrificing is artistic expression for consistency. And when you're writing knowledge source, you want consistency because this is your programming language for knowledge. And you want to be able to be sure that all your links are going to be the same way. And again, you haven't violated any, you haven't, you haven't customized anything or anything like that. Uh, so here we go. Um, blah, 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 blah. Back to, what am I doing here? All right. All right, Mr. Rob. This one and this one. Okay. Oops. So, so, so that's how you do a link. Oh God. Come on, help me. I need more coffee. So that's how you do a link. Reference links. Don't use reference links. I just ranted about that. We're going to make it. Um, auto, auto, uh, auto linked URLs. So auto linked URLs are, are, are URLs, uh, that are like in the raw and they, they have a, a angle bracket. This is called and a, a bracket right here, by the way, speaking of brackets, um, let me, I actually have a little thing here. I want to go through cause we talked about keyboards. If you go to rwx.gg slash brackets, you'll see what brackets are. And so the term brackets is confusing. Here's a table to remind you. Square brackets are square. Curly brackets are curly. They look like braces. Uh, and angle brackets are uh, less than or greater than signs used to encapsulate something. Just so you know, that's what those are about. So angle brackets around this. Always use angle brackets. Stupid formats like GitHub, Flavored Markdown have decided to automatically sense your URLs and they get it wrong all the time. Always, always put angle brackets around your URLs because sometimes it'll be HTTPS, sometimes it might be FTP, it might even be a mail to URL. You guys know about these things? So just use angle brackets always, okay? Um, here, here's a good example of like a mail to angle bracket or a telephone angle bracket, you know? Uh, and you can do those things actually. If you do that, those look really good on a phone um, when they're rendered. You can actually click it, it'll dial the number and everything. It's pretty cool. So images. Images. We're going to jump ahead to images. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess we're laughing about mail to, but you know what? A mail to link on a phone is very valuable because that like automatically opens their mail tool and you can just like type in their, their message and be done. Uh, so images, images, uh, are the same exact thing as links, except for they have an exclamation point in the front. That is it. And hopefully you're trying all of these things as you go. Um, so here is an exclamation point. And, and this is a local link. So this is a link to, to something that's on my system. Uh, <laughs> and, and gnome. <laughs> and, um, let's see here. Let's see remote images. So that's actually broken right now. Probably because I moved the image out. I'm sorry about that. Um, and so here we go. This is a little bit fancy. What's this doing people? Anybody want to tell me what's going on here? 
What is going on here? This is the most complicated markdown you will ever see. This is, this is it. If you can understand this, you can understand all markdown. It's an image inside of a link. Yep. And I'm not, yes, good job, guys. And let me, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't want to overstate this. This is as difficult as it gets. <laughs> okay. This is it. Because this is a format that's designed for anyone to be able to write. Non-technical people, technical people, everyone should be able to write this format. And, and that's why I love it. I think, I think it's way better than HTML. Uh, so here's, here's a list. Uh, lists just begin with stars. It's very intuitive. Uh, if you want to have a nested list, you know, you can actually space over four spaces. It has to be four spaces. Uh, and you can put stuff under there. Um, however, I will, I would recommend that you, you know, don't go crazy with the, you know, really complicated outlines. Um, humans don't digest outlines like that very well. If you, in fact, I, I went back on my own site and I was like looking at my day breakdown. See, look at here. You can see it left over. Here's, here's my breakdown with all the, the stuff in it, right? It's like, which one is easier to digest? This one or these, right? So I'm not a fan of like really, really, and in, in, you know, a lot of, of linked into, um, indentation and stuff like that. That's just, just, just me. I try to keep it at one list. By the way, if you want to cut and paste this stuff into a blogging service like Medium, you can't use more than one, la one layer of, of bullets. You can only get one, one top layer of bullets. So, uh, and, and by the way, uh, you can use lots and lots of things for bullets. If you want to later, that's fine. If you stick with the stars, it'll work everywhere. Okay. So just less to remember. That's what I'm trying to help you out with. Uh, if you want to do a numbered list like this, HTML, CSS, blah, uh, you just put ones. Why are they all one? I get this all the time. It's not Mr. Rob. It's all one. Why not one, two, three? The reason for that is what happens when you want to reorder them? Right? When you want to reorder them, if you have numbered them and you don't have a fancy editor that renumbers your numbers automatically, which defeats the whole purpose of Markdown and the perp and the begin the, the whole point of Markdown is that it's easy to edit with any text editor and you don't have to have a text editor that automatically renumbers everything. So if you do it like this, then it will automatically renumber when it renders. So I suggest doing that. There is a little inconvenient because when you're editing, it's like you have to count one, two, three. Okay, that's that's number five if you care about the numbers. So, but so I just suggest using the one dots. Uh, Pandoc allows lots of other things uh, besides that, but that's just you know, including Roman numerals and blah blah blah. But but for now, let's stick with that. Uh, distinguishing starless from italics uh, and bold. Uh, well, okay, italics and bold are only uh, around words. Okay, so so he's asking a question about italics and bold. So italics, the 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 actual code uh, to identify italics and bold and stuff like that, is it looks for uh, a space and then a star and then a letter or something, and and that's how it identifies it. Whereas a bulleted list is always a star at the beginning of the line followed by a space, blah blah blah. And same same thing goes with link uh, with the other lists. And so if you look at the parsing, which I've actually attempted two parsers for this because uh, I wanted to rewrite the Haskell into um, you know Go or something else. Um, and so that's you know that's that's how their parser works. And you want to keep the parser nice and simple anyway. So so that's what's going on. How do you remember all this stuff? This is not too hard to remember. Go to go to rwxgg slash markdown and look it up. But I, I, it takes you about 20 minutes to do. And after you've been taking notes for a week, you'll have it memorized. So this is what I suggest you do to take notes. All right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's like just practice, practice, and get a lot better. Just start taking notes. Start taking notes with nothing more than a text editor. And I guarantee you this stuff will start to sink in and you'll start to just use it all the time. It's very intuitive. Uh, and you think this is hard to remember. Try to remember HTML. We're going to do HTML in our second segment, in our last segment today. Try to com try comparing this to HTML. Which one would you like to remember? <laughs> you know, so uh, escaping characters. Y yeah, you can backslash to escape any character, but we're not going to talk about that. Normally, you don't need to do that if you stick with the simple stuff. Um, yeah, it's really not that that hard. There's not a lot of extra uh, and. Um, yeah, after this HTML, I'll never ever go back. And I'll show you in VI how you can render Markdown in the middle of an HTML page without leaving it. Hmm. Yeah. So, 
And again, why would you do it this way? Why not use Google Docs? I'm going to let you think about that for a while. Answer that question for yourself. Why would you use this instead of Google Docs? And if you don't know the answer, I, I challenge you to figure out the advantages and disadvantages of both. I'm not going to tell you the answer straight up. Okay. Uh, I want you to figure out why you would want to maintain your notes using Markdown on GitLab versus GitHub or versus Google Docs. They both work, right? So, so what's better? You know what I mean? I think you guys, I think you guys should come to that conclusion for yourselves. And, I, and I'm not going to, I don't want to spell it out for you. You should really give this some thought. But the first time you need to make a change and you want to go back to the change that you made last week. I'll tell you right now that on Google Docs, it's not as easy to do that. Or when you're starting to write code or something and Google Docs decides it wants to capitalize something or MS Word. Oh my God, MS Word. Try writing any kind of coding documentation in MS Word. It's a disastrous fail. It's like, um, so anyway, let me finish. We're almost done. And it takes PowerPoint to take your notes. Yeah. And with Markdown, you can convert into any other form. You want a Word doc? Great. Run Pandoc and you get your you got your format. You want PDF? Great. You want a Kindle doc? Great. So so my contention is that the one true way to capture your knowledge is Markdown. And the simplest way to start is this basic Markdown. So here we go. Here's separators. Separators is one of my biggest complaints. So a separator is just four dashes. That's it. Why four dashes? Because it's easy and it's one more than three. Because three dashes is used for YAML, which we'll talk about. Um, I don't think we're going to talk about that today. Did I skip? Did I skip structured documentation? Please tell me I didn't. Nope, we didn't. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, here we go. Configuration files and dot files and all that stuff. I'm trying to figure out when we're yeah, structured text is another day. Uh, so anyway, here we go. Um, uh, we do any camel case. Uh, camel Actually, if you're going to do camel case and that kind of thing, I would put it in back ticks. Anytime you want to refer to like a piece of code in like in line in your paragraph, put it in back ticks. So, so yeah. Um, uh, this this uh, line divider, guys, this four dashes is one of my biggest complaints about the original markdown. There are literally an infinite number of ways that you can separate your pages. You can put three dots in the middle. You can put any characters you want, any number of characters. Uh, I just strongly recommend that you stick with four dashes. Why? Because if you have, if you have, um, you can use backticks for everything. If, if you use dashes for your lines, you can grep them out. Anytime you use it, you can grep it out. You can find it. If you don't do that, you can't. By the way, I, I skipped something on headers. Markdown supports the use of a god-awful syntax that allows you to actually put dashes under your your titles. And I used to be a big fan of that because it looks really pretty in your source code. But it is a... I'm going to say it. Bitch to grep it. When you're trying to find all the headers in your file, like right now, if I try to find all the headers in my file right now, how can I find all my headers? Anybody want to guess? Here we go. I'm going to grep all of the things that start with a star uh, a hashtag. There, I only have level one, level one. Uh, let's see if I, okay, let's say I want to do multiples of them. Uh, I don't even know what that is in egrep. <laughs> so let's say I want all my level two hitters. There, there they all are, right? Now, if I, if, if, yeah, was low, I just made a big point about level one. So level two pulls up. See all that? Now, if I, if I had done it this other way that Markdown allows, where I put little underlines under all of my thing and make it look pretty in the source code, I could never grep it like that. Don't do it. Just don't do it. You'll like make your life a living hell trying to deal with your Markdown. And, and I've just been there. All right. So hard returns. We're almost done here and we're going to wrap up this, this one and you can play around with editing your notes. And may I challenge you as of today, this is why this is on the second day is to start taking notes in Markdown about everything we cover, everything, the stuff you're reading, this, that's a big part of being an autodidact or a, of somebody who controls their own learning and somebody who's doing their own research. Start taking notes, start writing down, even though you think you know it, 
write it down anyway because it'll help to process it. Um, if you like taking notes uh, in a written form, that's fine. A lot of people, it's actually, people say it's better for you to remember it that way. That's also fine. But spend at least some amount of time writing writing in this and if and if you want to start a markdown page and call it your blog you can actually start writing your blog content today and and start blogging about your journey through the beginner boost in this way you can actually start writing in markdown today and say i had trouble with this i did this and this you like might actually find it more might useful later depending on how much time you have and and just start out in markdown you don't have to th you don't have to even think about what it's going to be. Is it going to be a Kindle book? Am I, is it going to, am I going to write the notes of, you know, so-and-so? And it is my epic journey. Is it going to become, uh, you know, a PDF? Is it, is it, what's it going to be, right? You don't even have to care about that right now because all you need to know is that you need to write in basic markdown and any one of those options is available to you later. You can pick up any of those options, okay? Um, you might not even like this particular editor, uh, and I'm going to let the chat and the Discord suggest alternative editors. There are a lot of other Markdown editors like Joplin. Uh, for taking, but, but let me just stress one thing about all the people who chime in with their favorite editors for Markdown. Um, your best editor for Markdown is your test text editor. And as of tomorrow, I'm going to strongly, strongly encourage you to use VI as your editor for your thing, no matter how painful it is, because this is your opportunity to practice and you can take the notes using VI and you will hate it. You will, it will be frustrating and you'll want to pull your rest of your hair out and you, but you're going to learn by doing it and, and you can commit to yourself that you really want to learn it and just force yourself to, to go through that, to, to go through that state. If, if that is not your thing, fine you can do it however the way you want if you want but make sure that whatever method you're using ties to your git repo because as soon as you decouple your tool from git you got problems you know what i'm saying but it, yeah if you've got some fancy dancy you know git management tool and you just want to open it up and edit it with notepad on your local system fine um you can word perfect i love word perfect it's one of the better editors i wish it would have won um so uh and and then so just to, you know so let's finish the markdown thing i have five minutes to finish the markdown thing and then and then after this we're going to really torture ourselves so we're going to jump right into some html and make our first web page in the next segment so roses are red space space that's a space don't actually type that violets are blue if you want to force a hard return use two two or more spaces and this is actually very useful sometimes you want to have the paragraph return early but still be in the same paragraph uh as you see here roses are red and violets are blue so that's how you do that um here you go you get it if you use um if you use the vimpandoc plugin you get a little ligature here that shows you it's actually not a ligature it's just a symbol that shows you you know what's going on People are afraid that they won't be able to see their two blank spaces. Well, that will show it to you if you use a proper editor. Uh, blocks. Now, blocks are really important. I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to kind of scream through this. So please pay attention. Um, blocks Blocks separate text or code from any document, usually as a box. There are two main block types to remember. Plain, pre-formatted, and code fences. Code fences is one of the best contributions from github flavored markdown i believe it's the only good contribution from github flavored markdown um so here we go this is a code fence so a code fence this is a plain plain uh this is they call it a fence because it kind of looks like fence posts and i regularly refer to three back ticks as fence posts uh, the standard allows all different types of combinations and numbers of those just use three back ticks Seriously, people, just use three back ticks, okay? And then you, you know where it is. You can find it, and, and it's standardized. It's supported by Discord. You try this in Discord, by the way. Go to Discord and do three back ticks, and then actually do the next one, the code fences. So this is just roses, red, plain old text, right? But if you do actual code, go do this. Try something like this in Discord. So send a message to yourself or to your friend like this with Discord, and it will do full syntax highlighting for you. Slack does not do that. Unless they added something, because the last time they said they did not do that. Uh, so yeah, they're called, they're called code fences. That's the, the vernacular for them. Uh, people use four back ticks all the time. Four back ticks is not supported by Discord. Use three. Just use three back ticks. Three back ticks is the most universal. Uh, if you insist on using your own variation of it, that is fine. You are your own person. I'm just telling you what 
I have found saves me time and energy uh, by not having to, you know, I can search all of my code base and my knowledge base and I can find every single backtick uh, code fence because I have used the same convention throughout and I've not expressed myself artistically in my markdown. Okay, um, so here we go. Uh, so let's see here uh, that I do not have color syntax. I, I have, if you do have color syntax, this will show colors. Um, okay, so by the way, oh, here's a short list of the supported tags MD, JSON, Markdown, JSON, JS, HTML, CSS, and SH. So you can use these little these little um, indicators to, to get the proper syntax for the syntax highlighting. Oh, I'm running short on time. Exceptions for Markdown. I make one exception for Markdown, and this might be a case where you could say, I want to use four back ticks. In my case, for this exception, whatever exception you use, just make sure that it's consistent across your code base. Okay, my exception is that I use three tildes when I want to put Markdown in something. And it is the only, I know it's weird, but it's the only exception that I use. Uh, and and I put, uh, so this is a case where I want to make a, 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 I want to make a Markdown document that contains Markdown. It's, in, it's like one of those inception situations. And, and I don't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't appear properly if I did not do that. So that's the only exception I make. Um, there's like a really, really weird exception on top of that, uh, which is not even worth mentioning where you want to include Markdown that is showing Markdown. And, and that's probably the only other case to make like, I, in that case, I use four tildes, but those are really, really rare. I mean, that would be somebody, it would be only occur when you're doing documentation about Markdown. Um, so anyway, there are an infinite number of possibilities there. Uh, okay. Block quotes. Uh, so block quotes a little bit different. Uh, I am not a big fan of block quotes. Uh, I used to be a huge fan of it, uh, but I'm, I'm much less of a fan these days because I use what's called Pandoc divs, um, which I, I won't talk about until we we'll cover Pandoc at some point. Um, note blocks that you have on the site. These note blocks, these note blocks that I'm using are using, are using Pandoc divs. And I want to caution you about Pandoc divs. They are only supported in Pandoc and they are not supported naturally on GitLab and GitHub. Uh, and if you want them, you can actually get the equivalent sort of by, by using a, a, a quote like this. So a block quote is anything that begins with a greater than sign. And, and it's just everything until the end of that. If you want to do multiple lines, you have to do multiple lines. Can I just really recommend against doing multi-line block quotes? They are so annoying because every time you change something, you have to reformat and put another greater than at the beginning. Uh, this is the reason that you'll see me make rampant. I finally gave in and said, screw it. I'm using, <laughs> it's like, I am, this is one of the greatest things about, um, about Pandog, as I said, fine, forget it. I am going to, this is another thing. So this table here, I'm just showing you some things that are in Pandoc that are not in GitHub Flavor Markdown, nor GitLab, nor Common Mark. This is why I use Pandoc. So this this table that I did here, this is the syntax for tables uh, from Pandoc. If you compare it to the syntax for tables and GitHub, you'll see what a disastrous fail uh, GitHub Flavor Markdown tables are. They're, they're absolutely horrible. They actually have tools to create them because they're so complicated. And then, um, and then if you see here, here's like Markdown here. Here is, um, you guys are wondering about some of my, my, my things. So here is, this is called a, a Pandoc div. Um, I'm just giving you some bonuses here uh, with code blocks right now. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't have these. Uh, so it doesn't have three, uh, the three, the three um, colons, which is what they call, um, uh, it's called a, it's called a Pandoc div. And what that does is it just turns this section into a div. That's it. Oh, it is break time. Uh, just did a code fence in Discord. Nice. Uh, so that would be that. Um, I, did I cover everything? What am I missing? Uh, so I would just use quotes for quotes, by the way. Um, here's the rare case where you have a quote with multiple lines. Tables. Uh, and this is just me really going off on GitHub. I think they really ruined our world uh, <laughs> by... <laughs> by trying to do tables in a most horrible, complicated way, which they, this is why JGM is very politely says, I'm sorry, no, we're not going to be adopting those in common mark. Common mark doesn't have any tables at all, at all, because there was the table thing is so, so toxic and so 
charged because GitHub has got their table format everywhere, and Pandoc comes around, JGM comes around and does this absolutely ridiculously simple, elegant table format, and he's like. I kind of like my tables better. Let's just decide to disagree. And so we'll make common mark not have tables at all, which is why the next step after that is Pandoc clearly. And, and when you want to take it up a notch and you want to start just adding this kind of stuff, you can do it. It's not, it's not HTML specific. I'll take my break. When we come back, we'll be doing all of the same thing. Uh, we'll be making a, a, a repo for a website uh, and I'll show you how you can um, publish a simple website. If you want to make your private notes public, you can do that. It's not that hard to do it differently, but it will it'll give us a chance to make another repo for that. So I'll be back at uh, 10 after the hour. And in the meantime, I'll let the moderators uh, take over, have fun playing around with this stuff. Uh, yeah, we won't even talk about it. Pandoc also supports math notation and, and a bunch of other things, which is why you eventually want to go into Pandoc Markdown. Um, so, yep. And in my opinion. All right, so I'm going to be AFK until, what, 1, 10? All right. See you soon. I don't have any fish today. <laughs> So if you're wondering what to do, go take a break or write some more notes. Practice your notes.
blah, 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 Um, <laughs> B-Boost? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I want everybody to be able to come in and do whatever. Um, all right. I am back, uh, a little bit late. One minute. We're going to need every second of this last segment, which is going to go all the way till two, uh, to make a web page. And I'm not going to pretend to teach you HTML in one day, um, but we're going to, it's kind of, a, I call it a walkthrough. I'm just going to show you the process for making a web page uh, so that if you want to shoot ahead and start doing the web development uh, work in the book, uh, you'll know how I recommend that you do that. And it's actually not so far, it's not um, any different than making notes like you've been doing. So the first thing we're going to do is make another project on GitLab. And uh, of course, this is the leftover project from the other thing. I don't need to stick with this. Uh, let's just, it's going to yell at me, but that's fine. Where is it? Group projects. Your projects. Oh, here comes the white again. Be careful. Watch your eyes. And then um, we're going to create a new project. Uh, and this time I'm going to call it, uh, by the way, I should probably show you how to delete a project. Let me just show that really quick and be careful. I'm just, I should show you this because you don't be me. You don't have like a hundred unused projects, right? So I'm going to actually go out and delete this project. It's actually really hard. Uh, you can use HTML boilerplate if you want. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go to settings down here. It's not really completely intuitive. I encourage you as homework today to like really flesh out what all these other things are about. Do your own research about GitLab. Uh, practice using the different things and seeing how it integrates. Uh, I, mean, I think it'll be educational for you. There's no way I can cover the whole thing in an hour or two. Uh, but if you do settings, um, let's see here. You click on settings if I remember right. And um, uh, and then we go to all the way down to the end. Um, some people no scream if they add an exclamation point I don't see it and that's why they're doing it um, so if you go all the way to the bottom um, and it says here advanced um, and you click on expand it's really hard to delete something yeah and you scroll down it's like be really careful do you want to archive it you want to change it uh, sometimes by the way a little, little gotcha here Sometimes people will think that they're changing the name of their project and they're really just changing the name up above, but they're not changing the slug. They're not changing the, the path. So you have to do that also. You have to come down here and change it down here. Just That's a, that's a common gotcha. Uh, and then if you go down here to transfer a project, you can transfer it to some other group or you're completely away from, or you can delete it. And this is really annoying. This is why I have so many leftover repos on GitHub and GitLab because it's so annoying to remove a project. You can't just make one and delete it like a file or directory. You have to actually go through all of these graphic steps. And which is why it's the number one first thing I'm going to add to my automation. But you got to be really careful. I don't want to destroy all my repos. And then they make you type in this little thing here and type notes and that will delete my notes. So I don't need it. It still shows here because I haven't refreshed. Um, <laughs> uh, it has to have something right after it, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, um, so, so there, new project. Uh, we're going to click on new project and what are we going to get? Well, this time let's call it www. All right. And I don't, it doesn't matter where it goes. I'm going to go ahead and put it under, uh, I guess like, I mean, it really doesn't matter where you put it. Just don't forget it where you put it. It's really easy when you start, you don't think so now, but later on when you have a hundred repos, it's going to be really hard to find things. So I'm going to go ahead and add this one under my individual account, which normally I wouldn't do. I'm just doing that on purpose because uh, I don't want to have it conflict with anything else that I have. And let me recommend the name to you uh, of www. And um, uh, w later on, when we make an actual website, what I'm going to recommend that you do is you make a group that matches your website name. 
Uh, we're not going to talk about that this week. Um, uh, on Namecheap, you go to Namecheap and get a domain name, and then you create a group that matches your domain name, and then under there you have a www project, and you can put the code for your project on that www on your on your domain, and that's just a way to to organize it. it doesn't have to be that way, but that's just that's my convention for doing this. So, um, so that you see it, it pulls it down here and changes the slug. I'm going to keep the visibility private. You you can choose. You do not need to make your website source code visible. And there's a pretty good argument against making your source code for your website visible uh, because you can put things in your source code uh, like Easter eggs and things like that that people can't see. Do not ever depend on not linking to web content for security. Uh, there are tools uh, in the first level of, of like hack the box and other thing uh, to what's called brute forcing all of those URLs and they will find your stuff. So if you put something in there and you think, oh, this is hidden, nobody knows about it and my repo's private. Fail. Major, major fail. I mean, they will find everything. In fact, <laughs> they did that. I had it out of convenience. It was nothing I was really a secret. The people ran GoBuster on my, on my site and they found a bunch of stuff there. Uh, that I had unlinked um, because it, I didn't wasn't really particularly useful. It was outdated, and they were able to find content that I that I had not directly linked from my website. So don't don't ever depend on this privacy hiding content that is public, uh, even if it's not linked. Okay. So, but anyway, we're going to make it private. We don't need to do anything more with that. Great project. So again, this is just a repeat of what we did in the last segment. We're just re re we're adding a thing. Um. Uh. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so then you go here and you've got, I, I, I did it as an Easter egg hunt for my people. And, uh, which is fine because that's teaching them how to use Buster and how to find things out and all that. So I actually did it on purpose uh, in part from, to make it an Easter egg and partially because I didn't want people to directly link. Uh, so just don't do that. Okay. So then we have here, um, this repository is, um, empty so we're going to add a new file just like before all of this stuff down here if you don't understand it, it will tomorrow tomorrow we're going to do all of this stuff so they click on new file i got this window that's annoying i'm going to close that and and we're doing good on time okay so now we have a a brand new file and uh, a place over here that kind of uh has a soft wrap for us if we want it but and at this time instead of readme.md uh we're going to make a file called index.html and Eventually, we're going to show you how to make index.html files out of uh, Pandoc files. And if, if you haven't noticed, uh, if you want to watch me doing this, I do this every day uh, when I'm editing. That's what I'm doing over here. So if you look at, um, let's say, that markdown file we were just working on. So markdown. You see in here that there is the readme. And I'm going to show you how to make this. Is it next week? Next week or the week after? We're going to we're going to make our own knowledge bases that are rendered from Markdown. So you write the Markdown. Here's the Markdown um, for that page. It's up at the top. It's called uh, Front Matter. We'll get into that another time. And and then uh, I run Build Markdown, just to give you a little pre preview of what you're going to be learning. And um, the build script is, is relatively simple. If you know Bash, we're going to learn Bash. We're writing some Bash tomorrow, by the way. So this is a, a basic script. All it does is loop through all the readme files and run Pandoc on them. And when it does, you get a file called index.html, uh, which is generated from a template and contains all the HTML. Now, which one would you rather write? <laughs> Not a tough question there, is it? Uh, would, you rather, <laughs> would you rather write... Would you rather write this... Or this its rendering is HTML this. I mean, because you this is what you would have to write if you didn't. There's a table. This is just a table. Just a table alone would be so annoying. Next please. <laughs> I, I know. So so you can see the difference. And we're gonna go through that. Alright, so where are we? So index.html uh, is the name of the file. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and start out um, a file. And I just want to show you right away that, that you can put anything in this directory. So, hello, my future website. Oops. 
website. Just put text in there for now. Who cares? Watch how easy it is to make a website. I mean, we're not going to do any HTML. Just do plain. Uh, <laughs> so, so just do plain old. Uh, just do a plain old text. Who cares, right? Let's just do text and commit commit changes. We're going to make a website here in the next five minutes. I'm going to publish this whole thing in five minutes. Uh, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so here we go. We have, hello, I, I can't answer that question because I'm in the middle of a thing, modders. So, hello, my future website. So, this shows that it's just a plain old thing. Well, let's publish it. So, this is where another service comes in. And you don't even really have to sign up for this service because it does it automatically. In fact, if you have a ProtonMail account, it won't let you sign up. It's kind of a stupid thing. I, 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 I don't like that all the services are being really finicky about any email address that's not Google. Um, but it's just the nature of the beast. So we go out to another service called netlify.com. N-E-T-L-I-F-Y.com. Netlify is a fantastic service for lots of reasons we'll get into in the knowledge is source uh, week. Uh, but for right now, just understand that this is how you're going to publish your website for free uh, to over three, four, five hundred 500 um, servers all over the world. And so what we're going to do here is it says log in and sign up. Um, we can go ahead and, and click sign up. Uh, when you click on sign up, just click on, just remember if you're going to do sign up, uh, when you do sign up, click on um, uh, get lab. Okay, so if you do sign up, it'll say get lab, right? So click on get lab. If you do email and you have ProtonMail, it'll fail. You can use Bitbucket or GitHub if you want. I strongly suggest you use GitLab and just sign in with GitLab. Netlify and GitLab are almost like joined at the hip. They are like really close, uh, you know, in their in their usage. And so, uh, and if you know about GitHub's um, Jekyll Publishing, this is way way faster in terms of like delivering your site as well as it's it's how it's deployed. So here you'll see I'm signed in and I have a number of other sites I built. But this is the the button you need right here: new site from Git. Okay, new site from Git. And when you click on new site from Git, it will give you uh, the steps. And it says, where do you want to grab it from? GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. GitHub, Git, and we're going to say GitLab. And then it will ask, uh, oh, that's interesting. Reject request authorization. I do not know why that is. Well, let's pretend like yours doesn't have that error. I don't know if that's because of this or not. Might be because my brave is is not happy right now. Uh, I I haven't seen that in a while actually, so I don't know what's going on. I have to do this in a different web browser. No, there it was. A brave just got in the way. Uh, Bitbucket is another hosting service, but I would not use that one. Um, so if you get a 401 unauthorized, turn brave. Maybe it looks like you have to drop your shields. I I didn't know that. So you might have to drop your shields. Okay. I had to drop. If you're using brave, you might have to drop your shields for this site. I did, and it works. So. And here it looks. Um, if you're using, well, if you're using Chromium, um, did you click on? I don't know. We can we can work on that. I have to walk through this, and then I'll we'll come back and resolve some issues. Um, if anybody, if that's not working for anybody, help each other out, people. Figure that out. Um, but it's supposed to. This is what it's supposed to do. And uh, when it does this, it will show you all of your stuff. And then you can actually change what your group is. I have lots of groups, as I said. So I, I'm using my plain old user account here, and and here um, and here is my RDX Rob www project, and that has nothing in it. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to. It's going to give it a random ownership, and then I'm going to say deploy. I don't even really need anything else besides that. I click on. So you don't need build and command and publish. You don't need any of that. You don't need any of it. You can eventually use it to make a very involved, complicated site that will render every time you commit, but you don't need it. Okay. So really all you need is this. And as you can see now, I have this really, uh, I have this insane site. So my site is now published with this really stupid name, uh, that I can change. So I'm going to show you how to change the name. Um, and so you click on site settings and you go down here and you click on change site name right here, right? Uh, and you can pick this name is unique across all of Netlify, so you can pick whatever you can play. It's like I'm gonna say boost b boost uh, www dash www or whatever. And down here it tells you you know what your your app ID reference is gonna be. You can tell that to anybody in the world, and they can go there to your site. And I'm done.
I'm now published and my site is published. Good to go. Okay, but now this is where it really gets fun. Okay, so so my site is now, um, uh, yeah, I don't I don't re-render that much. I've never actually hit my cap ever, not once, uh, and I <laughs> regularly commit a lot. Um, but <clears throat> oh, I don't use rendering at all. Oh, you're talking about rendering from the site? Yeah, don't do that. I, rendering takes up massive cycle. What he's talking about is um, you can actually have the site render your your static site content. You know, like run the Pandoc thing or whatever you want, want to build, uh, Hugo, whatever, Jekyll, to to make your site. And that's why I actually pre-render everything and I have never hit a cap. Uh, there's an argument against doing that that I don't want to talk about right now. We will talk about it more in depth when we get to the Knowledge as Source week, uh, which is not, I don't know if it's not next week, it's the week after that. So we're going to come back to this, but I just wanted to show you how to make a website really quickly. And we have like half an hour or so left to finish our website. Uh, but so now here's what's really cool. I can go back to Markdown. Oh wait, where's my, where's my, please tell me I still have my, there it is. Okay. So here's my thing, right? I'm not even going to use the fancy editor right now. I can actually, that'd be a time for us to try to use the fancy editor, but, but let's, um, let's just use the plain old editor. So the plain old editor, we're going to use the plain old editor and now I can, I can start this out. So uh, as you guys know, um, we're going to do, uh, I call it the HTML5 challenge. What's the first, what's the first one? Doc type HTML, right? And that is the only one you ever need. You need HTML to go around everything. Uh, by the way, I really hate things that try to help me. I, I, cause you see how I have to like work around its help. Uh, it's just, I just don't like it. So, and then I'm going to say, what goes next? Anybody know? Every HTML document has a head and a body. Inside the head, we'll put a title. Uh, hello there. And uh, and then we have a body. A body. And we'll put... Um, we'll, we'll do this properly. We'll put a main... Uh, let's say we'll give it a header. And inside the header, we'll put the... Um, uh, an H1. It says... Uh, uh, the hello world uh, page. You can do whatever you want here. And then we'll have a main section. These are called semantic HTML. You should be using them. If you're not, do it. Um, and then down in main, we'll have um, uh, this is the main is the main part of the page. And you can have a footer uh, and down here we could have, uh, I don't know, cop we can make a paragraph and put copyright me or something. And um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be that fancy. And to do this right, I should probably make a paragraph here. This is going to suck because it's going to put the paragraph tag. It doesn't know how to wrap. Um, and I just, I hate graphic editors. I really hate them. So this is the main part of the page. Okay. And then... Um, if you wanted to make italics, you know, you could do I with people like, oh, isn't that supposed to be EM? No, it's not. HTML5 fully and completely reinstated I and B as italics and bold for this for the sake of semantic meaning. So don't give me your crap about EM and strong. <laughs> so go read it if you don't believe me. Um, so there you go. Uh, you can't, I mean, EM and strong are the standard. That's usually markdown renders as EM and strong. It doesn't render as I and B, but if, but if you have to write HTML, you don't have to use EM and B, uh, surge that SH. Yes. I use surge for the first three years of skill stack. Surge that SH is fantastic. It's a command line tool. We've used it for about three or four years. The problem with surge is it's only on a single server. It's not in a CDN of any kind. So that's why I don't use surge anymore. Uh, I really, really liked it. It was my standard. I love the Walrus. It was my standard recommendation for, for, for at least three years. Uh, but I've since moved away from that. Netlify destroyed it uh, really as a service. It's not even really supported anymore, which is funny because there's like uh, referrals and uh, from both from both services from a single person. Um, let's see, but Pandoc file. Yeah, so you guys want to try to do Pandoc? Uh, we're going to teach you how to do that in a little bit. <clears throat> I'm not going to do that today, though. Uh, but if you want to try your hand at Pandoc, yes, SO file, do the job. Yes, that's what you're talking about. That's that's exactly what you would do. Um, yep. Yep, for this example. Um, if you want to add a template, if you, if you want to add it, a template, be dash dash template equals, if you're doing Pandoc, 
uh, if you otherwise it's going to use one of their default templates. So we go ahead and we click on save. As you can probably guess, uh, this is what's so amazing. You can put a comment here if you want. Commit changes. Um, I, there's one warning I want to show you about with the web IDE um, that I want to show you. So here, here we go. There's our web page now. We go look at the website and we refresh here. Hey, look, I have a site. Huzzah! I have a site. All right, so let's let's do a little bit of style. Um, and let's do a little bit of JavaScript and let's do an image and that will be a basic site. And that's actually pretty much the first chapter of, um, of the, you know, the Bistro project, which is uh, the first chapter of the web design book, which we're going to get to in several weeks. Uh, but if you want to jump ahead, you can, you know, start getting going on this. You can make your site today. Um, so, uh, and, oh, oh, I did want to talk to you about some resources for the web, uh, that are out there besides the book. So uh, the, the main resources, I haven't got this in the documentation yet, so let me just tell you. So the, uh, I believe when you do searches for web stuff, uh, like how, let's see, how do I make a header in HTML? Uh, the, some of the first hits are almost always going to be W3 schools. They, they, in fact, this is such a thing. They used to actually, they created a whole site called W3 Fools uh, against the site W3 schools. This is called W3 Fools. It's a little bit of an Easter egg, uh, but as a but it, this was in 2011. But they've since caught up, and made this comment here basically says, "Yeah, they're fine now." Uh, but if, it's kind of fun for you to go take a peek at that. Uh, W3 Schools does have re relatively reliable information, so you can go up here. Oh, back to safety. No, I'm absolutely fine. I don't know what you're talking about. W3 Schools is that some sort of Trojan version of the same thing? I don't know. I don't care to know. Don't don't like that it's probably that's probably w3 schools not liking my brave and i don't feel like authorizing it right now anyway so that's one source to go to if you want to dig a little bit deeper uh the other really solid source for information is mozilla uh developers network um so that's uh, uh mozilla developers network um let's see if i can find it and this is um, this is pretty damn good, but it's still not the best. I'm going to tell you the best, okay? And I found that even Developers Network has problems because it's a wiki, basically, that's supported by lots of people. Do you know where the best source is? Does anybody know? Anybody want to guess where the best source is? The MDM, yeah. Does anybody else want to guess where the absolute, positively best source for web stuff is? Not even w3.org. Let's try w3.org. It's a good guess. Let's do that one. W3.org is the organization that created the World Wide Web, right? But what happened? Oh, CSS Tricks is really good, but nope. Uh, it's stealing other people's source. <laughs> Paul from next door. <laughs> so W3C has got a problem. Does anybody on the chat know what happened to W3C and why it's kind of irrelevant today? I don't, I, I apologize, W3C. I don't mean to offend you, but something came along and pretty much stole all their thunder. Does anybody know it? Hmm. Okay, so it's called, nope, it's called the Web Working Group. Nope. HTML5, which was created by who, people? I think it's important that everybody understand that HTML5 did not come from W3C. It came from the Web Working Group. So the Web Working Group, the what WG, just in a nutshell, is Google. Uh, God, who else? Where's the list? Created by Apple, Google, Mozilla, and Microsoft. So the creators and owners of all of the browsers basically thumbed their nose at W3C and said, you know what? We control everything. <laughs> so we're going to decide what's going to go down. Basically the same way Netscape did, if you remember back in the 90s, and said, no, you know what? We like the blink tag and we're going to do it. So NCSA, you know, you can go fly away because we're going to make this. Yeah. And so what the WhatWG community came together, and this is hands down 
the best source for HTML uh, standards and content creation on the planet. And I challenge you to do your own informal research. And if somebody, if you run into somebody who's a web developer, if you ask them about where they get their HTML source, I guarantee you the last thing, if they even know about it, is the actual specification. And it's really sad <laughs> because this is the specification that their jobs are dependent on. And it's constantly living and it's changed. It was just changed on May 5th. And look at this. And here, here it is right here. It tells you the HTML syntax. It's got it's fantastic write-ups. It's got examples. It's got um, it's got end tags. It tells you examples of the tags, how they're properly used. This is the manual. So if you know what RTFM means this is it this is the manual for web development and it includes css it includes html uh and this is the first place you should go if you have a question okay all the other places are going to pop up earlier in searches and they have more examples possibly but this is really the authority uh so if you want to actually settle a debate about what something is read the friendly manual and go straight to it okay uh yeah thanks for posting the link um if uh and look at this, man. I mean, that's some pretty dang good notes here. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's very useful. There is one other resource for web development that I'm going to cover again in the web development section. But since you guys might run off without me uh, and do a little bit of web development on your own now that you know how to do it, uh, another thing, you, somebody asks the question all the time, can I use? So let's say, can I use? Can I use... Um, can I use, let's see, what's the really popular tag right now? Okay, can I use the B tag? Big ints? No, not big ints. Let's see. Can I use background? Let's see. I don't know. Let's see what we can find here. Let's. Can I use bold? So can I use the bold tag? JavaScript string bold? No, that's not what I want. Ugh, ugh. Come on. Come on, can I use? Don't fail me. No, I don't want to ask if I can use big ints. You think I need them? You think I need brackets? Okay, let's try that. So angle brackets. Can I use B? I feel really let down at this moment because I've never searched for this one thing. And now I'm feeling like it doesn't properly cover what I was asking a question about. Background, sync, API, blob, construction, jQuery. Maybe this is just a JavaScript thing. HTML for boomers. Yeah, that's the original uh, HTML specification. Um... You know, I'm sorry. I'm 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 mixing two things up in my head. I'm really really sorry. I I am can I use this only for JavaScript? So I don't think it's a I don't think it's an HTML thing. Um, I could have that wrong though. I, I I'm kind of spacing. Let's try strong because I know strong is in here. Yeah, HTML element. Oh, look at that. Okay, how about this? HTML element element B. Yeah, there you go. So HTML element B, it's finally there. It was just a little bit harder to find, so I was wrong. It is actually HTML and CSS and JavaScript. It tells you what browsers are operated in. Um, tells you you know whether it's green or not. Uh, you know, thank your lucky stars. You live in a time when the, uh, such a thing as evergreen browsers exists. Uh, that saved us from the hell that was Microsoft Internet Explorer, which refused and was unable to upgrade its browser on all these, you know, millions and millions of computers, which forced development to an ancient archaic standard. And now all the browsers are evergreen, which means they get upgraded, whether you like it or not, when you put it on the system. Uh, that has a lot of implications for privacy and stuff, but it, but it, but in terms of prog progress on the web, it's really awesome. Uh, IE6 everywhere. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you can get, uh, yeah, and system administrators too. Um, so it's it's a good thing. See, look here. There's some things like BDI. I can't use that one, right? That's got some problems here. So this is another site. Uh, okay. So as we, 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 we're doing really well on time. The only, the last two things I just wanted to show you uh, on making a website was how to integrate styles. Um, and you, you just get a sense of that. Uh, how to add a, a JavaScript file and um, how to bring in an image. Um, so, and possibly link to YouTube, which people love to ask. So I'm going to go back to the source code here. Um, but you, now you know where to go when you want to find, uh, the stuff. And I will provide links to those things. I just haven't got to all of that yet. I have links to it in other pages. I just haven't got those pages ported to the new RWX site yet. So, um, so here we go. 
We have our index.html. Um, so let's actually for this for this next stuff. Oh wow, thank you very much, um, uh, guys. For this this next stuff we're about to do, uh, we're gonna go ahead and click on the web IDE, and we're gonna use the the more powerful web and dark moded uh, web IDE. Now there's when I go to commit, there's a very important thing that I'm gonna tell you in a bit, and I don't want you to miss it. So make sure you stay tuned, uh, and it has to do with master branch. Okay, so um, <laughs> X Penguin. So, so here we go. We have all this thing. Let's go ahead and make a new file. Let's say we want. So, HTML is the structure. It's the content of a web page. Uh, CSS is the style. It's like what it looks like. So, we're gonna do that now, really quickly. I mean, this is really basic stuff. I'm, I don't mean to bore people. Um, and we're gonna type in. You know what's? You know what's? I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm getting. Wait, what's going on here? Why am I, I? I'm having a feeling that their dark mode might be sort of broken because I can't see what I'm typing. <laughs> so I am typing um, main dot CSS. Let's see if it works. What are you talking about? This is really weird. Oh, there it is. Okay, create file. I, that's their problem, not mine. I want you to know. So main.css, we got that, right? And I'm going to add uh, 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 what I call main. Everybody has their own names, main.js, and that will be uh, the JavaScript. So so CSS. CSS is the styles. So I'm going to go ahead and make uh, the body of my page. I'm going to select uh, everything in the body of my page to have a very glowing, crazy background. And I, also, I will admit this. I don't know if you can see this, but... All of this stuff that people really love about graphic browsers, this IntelliSense is called a language server, uh, is built in. It's built into the web ID. So this includes color. So watch, I can do like cyan and it'll tell me what color to type. So I don't, so what I'm trying to tell you is that if you're just starting out, if you're just helping someone start out, you don't have to install VS Code to get started using web development. Um, just using the web interface. Now, REPL, it's got a, a much better interface for this whole sorts of thing. But the really the big advantage of doing this with GitLab is that you can use this and you can combine it with your professional workflow, which would be using an actual computer and a, and a local editor and all that stuff, which we will do. So, but I just wanted to just kind of like champion the idea that you can use the editor on GitLab by itself. In fact, I've had an entire block of, of learning where we did nothing but build games just using the GitLab editor. And it's not that it's a little bit hard to preview and stuff like that because you have to wait for it to push to, to Netlify, but it's not that bad. It's really not that bad. So so let's go ahead and commit this CSS. Um, the CSS is the CSS is um, uh, I'm gonna have to. Get, okay, so here we go. Here's here's where the danger comes. So when I click, you know what? I think they changed it. They did. Oh nope. Here we go. Here's here's the biggest gotcha of all using GitLab using the GitLab editor, the web editor. Uh, by default, it does the right thing, which makes you make a new branch. And I don't know if you heard earlier today in the other segment, everybody was like, you want to use branches. Branches are good. And I'm like, yes, I know. But when you're doing something like this, an extra branch is going to mess you up. And you're going to put an extra branch down. You're going to save it. You're going to look at your site. And you're like, where's my changes? Changes aren't there. Why? Because they didn't get committed to the master branch. And if you committed to a separate branch, you have to merge the branches and blah, blah, blah. In fact, this is probably one of my biggest annoyances about using the web IDE, uh, particularly for beginners, because they always forget to click on commit to the master branch. Don't forget that. Just click on commit to the master branch and, and then click on commit. Uh, and, you know, it's like, uh, particularly for small projects, you know, involving involving people who don't, know or want to know a lot of stuff you know on the command line the really great thing about GitLab, i'm going to say it one more time is that when they grow into those professional workflows and structures they're already ready because the stuff is on GitLab already and they can download it and use git and, and use their favorite git tool or command line or whatever and and so we're going to do that all right so you saw here it committed the css changes and it's on the thing now we need to make the changes show uh so to do that we're going to actually have to add our little our link um, and we're going to add a, I wonder, well, that's not as good as VS code. Usually when you type, um, a link in, uh, in VS code, it'll give you a bunch of standard links that you can use. Uh, and the, uh, in this case, I'm going to have to remember it from scratch. 
Uh, and I don't, I think it's style sheet equals style sheet. <laughs> you guys are going to laugh at me because I have to look, I have to look this stuff up all the time. It's been a long time since I've been about development too. So, and then we have to say, I think it's H, is it href or source? I can't remember. <laughs> hey, what kind of person am I? Main.css. Um, I think that's it. Anyway, so I didn't need, I, I, where's my, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and look at the look at the people who know what they're talking about. Is it SRC? It is. It is SRC. All right, fine. SRC and I mix those up all the time. You do not need quotes; they are not required by the standard, um, unless you have crazy comments, lay stuff in there. And I am not I'm not ashamed of doing that. People will scream at me. If because it is a link, no. I don't. Well, you know what? Let's find out. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I uh, don't know. I, I I wasn't planning on getting that crazy with it. I I, I fine. So we're gonna commit this again. Is it committing to the master branch? Yes. Uh, and um, I don't. I mean, you know, I I I don't mind looking these things up. Uh, someone now is now is your time to tell me if you had a real editor, it would have been fine. You could have looked it up. <laughs> Or I could have just done a search for it. Yep. So here we go. I just don't like graphics. And I, as you know, I don't use them very much. So I would be looking at another file that does it already. Commit to master. You know, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat people. I'm not above cheating. Um, Where's my link? Link style shoot href. It is href. All right. Good. Good, good, good. Um, and I linked to main.css. And now when I go back to my hello there page, I should have a cyan background. Yep, there it is. Uh, so we have our colors. I mean, it's grotesque and we're going to be doing a lot more uh, with this than that. So I don't want anybody to get the idea that that's the extent of your development. I just want to show what's possible. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do is bring in a JavaScript page, uh, a JavaScript uh, file. And so inside of the JavaScript file, we'll just put uh, console.log hello there and uh, from the console you can do fancy colors and all that stuff I don't want to do it right now uh, but you just commit and that commits to, to the master branch it shows you the changes it previews it uh, I, that's new they didn't used to do that um, anyway so changes are made uh, however uh, I haven't made any I haven't linked it in here and I'm doing commits for everything, which is normally not a good thing in, in, in circles where people care about keeping their commit history clean. You know, they'll, they'll yell at you for doing that. Uh, you don't care right now because you're just learning and you're using it as a backup method. Okay. So we're going to do scripts here and then we're going to say SRC equals main.js and that has a period in it. So I have to put quotes around it. Uh, single or double. Double is the convention, even though I hate double quotes because they're harder to type. Um, <laughs> it's just, they're not that much harder, I know. So I'll just do it. Here's the thing that really drives people crazy batty uh, is that you, um, it's like, well, what's going on in here, right? Well, you can actually write, you used to be able to write code in here and uh, then they added the SRC. So it's really too bad that you can't link a JavaScript into the top. That this just one of those artifacts of history. It would have been great if you had been able to do that, but you can't. So you have to do it that way. Uh, I wish somebody would add a link support like that, but it, every single browser would have to support it, which means having a good idea doesn't necessarily get it adopted because it has to pass all of the other rigmarole. And then we're going to right click, inspect, oops, view page source. You see that there? That's not what I wanted though. Right click, inspect and then you see here's all my page uh it's got my dark reader editions in it but on the console if everything went well we have hello there from the console so now we have three pieces of our web page uh and we have time to add uh, a picture so i'm actually going to answer a little bit of comments um and uh, well i can tell you what let me go ahead and add a picture and then i will do that part um, so to, to add, I don't need that anymore. Um, so to add a picture, let's go find a picture. Um, I mean, I don't know. I guess I could, I guess I could do gnome rob. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, where should I, what should I add? Um, 
GG assets. I don't know what what kind of which picture should we put in here? Um, I guess I could. I, I think I have a picture already. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, well, I know I know where there is some. I'm this decision about what picture to use is like taking all the time. So <laughs> so let's go to um. Um, 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 John Wick. I like that example. John Wick. Uh, I don't want to search for pictures on a YouTube stream because that's a bad idea. Uh, so somebody's going to sue me for using John Wick, but I don't care. Oh gosh, not that one. Oh, that's the, that's the, whoa, somebody modded GTA. Interesting. Um, uh, I guess you can't really have a picture of John Wick without a gun. You know, it's weird. I don't think of John Wick as a gun-toting killer because that's what he is. I, he's much... He's a dog owner to me. <laughs> he's a dog owner. There's John Wick. All right, we'll put, we'll put that Keanu Reeves up. The nicest guy in Hollywood, apparently. Uh, and we're going to, like, save image as uh, downloads. Save to the downloads. Uh, we're going to go back here. Can't put it on there, so I have to go find my editor. Where is my editor? Here it is. And I click on the down upload button and I go find my downloads uh, and there should definitely be a John, is this it? Keanu Reeves, John Wick. Yep. And we'll open that. And there he is. I mean, that's a big old picture, but okay. Uh, and now let's put it into our thing. So let's click on the HTML. Go back to the HTML here. And you know what? They didn't used to have a previewer for pictures on there. That's kind of cool. Uh, do I have to commit? Okay, fine. I'll commit. Have I said how much I don't like graphic editors? Have I said that yet? Okay, commit. And so then... Oh, waiting for them. Okay, so then I'm going to close this. I'm going to go back to the index HTML. I'm going to put the picture in here. Um, I could make it the background. I can make it the foreground. Let's just go ahead and put it in the main page. Uh, IMG uh, SRC equals. Uh, oh my gosh, that name is way too long. Uh, we'll just put Keanu, Keanu. Dot. Is it a JPG? What kind is it? We're going to talk about t image types, by the way, um, because you need to know what they are about particularly if you're going into security, uh, .jpg. And that should just pull the image in. And this does not have an end image. Don't, if you read things that tell you to do this, that's they're old and outdated. Uh, that's old school XHTML, HTML4. You don't need that anymore. Meta tags maybe, but not there. Um, so that's an image source for Keanu Reeves. It's going to be really big. That should means I need to rename this, rename you to... Uh, Keanu, what is going on with my browser? Oh, well, I'm going to survive. Once again, graphics fails me. It just knows I hate it. That's why graphics tools know that I like deep down. I really dislike them and they just, they just know it and they punish me for it. Um, all right. So Keanu.jpg and then I'm going to commit that. And again, to master, I know that's an involved process because we're committing something to the internet. We're not just saving a file. We're saving it to something. Of that that, that pop-up's getting super annoying. Uh, and I think we have all of the changes here. And I can actually go over and look at the site. And if I refresh, I should have Keanu. And there he is. So we have Keanu there. Um, and we have our horrible web page. But my point is that you can get going on your editing today uh, and you can use uh, GitLab both for uh, doing some or some early stage uh, web development that will persist. It will stay with you. It will grow with you as opposed to using Repl where you have to copy everything over to something you're going to use as a professional workflow later. All of this stuff we just did is much, much, much easier on Repl if you just want to play around with the book and just learn. Um, but if you are willing to suffer through these little inconveniences, uh, the stuff that you are working on through the book uh, or, or on your own site uh, will go with you when you start to use, you know, the big tools, the real tools. 
Um, so that is what is up with that. Um, I am about ready to call it. We have five minutes left, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read some of the chat uh, messages just to wind up. And uh, let's see, Zero Theory says there's something. Uh, are all these steps going to be on your site? Yes. Um, my GitLab went haywire. Screw it. I'll figure it. Uh, you can figure it out just by looking at GitLab and trying all of that stuff. I strongly encourage you um, to to look at that stuff. Uh, as you're supposed to. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. <laughs> my web page does look terrible. <laughs> your web pages are going to look horrible. Uh, I do recommend writing notes in VI uh, as soon as possible. Tomorrow, just so you guys know, the tomorrow, the calendar for tomorrow. Uh, and by the way, if you want to look up the daily events, what they're going to be, go to rwx.gg slash week one. And I'll send you that really quick. Um, so if you want to go see, this is week one. And this is going to be changing a lot uh, over the time. As especially, I mean, I think that today's... Uh, day was was just about right. I'm really glad I didn't try to push more into there, and I did have some more stuff in there. Um, so we learned Markdown. We learned how to use the GitLab and the GitHub. We talked about why. We learned to use our keyboard properly. Uh, we, we talked about di different types of keyboards. Uh, I mentioned I was going to go ahead and make uh, a keyboard group. Uh, so you know, hardware uh, subcategories so people can post uh, their hardware ideas in there. Uh, we had a peek at web development, what that means, and how it works. Uh, we didn't really get too far into it, um, but and then we, we did publish our first code on Netlify. So at the end of today, and you should work on this if you don't have it today already, you should have GitLab account, you should have a GitHub, uh, GitHub account, you should, have a, you should have a GitLab repo uh, created, possibly a GitHub group that matches, you know, that has your real name instead of, you know, a GitHub group and a GitHub uh, individual account. And then you sh within one of those, you should put your www and your notes. And in your notes, you should start writing your notes in Markdown. And I strongly encourage you to write a full set of notes uh, about Markdown that includes all of the basic Markdown things that we covered that are linked from the day here uh, so that you have basic Markdown and start using it to take notes above all. The number one priority for today is taking away the ability for you to take sustainable notes for the rest of the boost. We are not going to come back to how to take notes. We're not going to talk about tools and you can do all that in the Discord, but I won't be talking about it anymore after today. Okay, so uh, so you should have all of that. If you want to explore web development and you're jumping ahead and doing that web development, you can go ahead and, and start playing with that now that you know about how to publish and edit on GitLab. Uh, tomorrow, the day will be entirely dedicated to Terminal. And I have a feeling there's more stuffed in today as of this moment than I think I can get through. Uh, and I'm going to be revising that tonight and going through it. Uh, but as of now, uh, tomorrow will be terminal all day. And that includes getting a terminal running on your system. I didn't say Linux. I said I said a terminal. And, and actually, I did say Linux. I said Linux terminal. So getting a Linux terminal, I don't necessarily mean that you have to install VirtualBox. You have to install Linux on your hardware. Uh, we're going to talk about the fastest way to get Linux running on your computer tomorrow. And we're going to come back under the, in the... We have an entire week dedicated to running Linux. And that involves, you know, all the different ways to run Linux uh, so it's not a Sigwin tutorial. No, it is. It is legitimately Linux. Uh, so we're, in Windows, we're going to be using WSL. If you know what that is, there's. If you follow this link, by the way, I wrote. I've written a, a, a great uh, tutorial that I've now tested with four or five different twelve-year-olds who made it without a hitch. Every single one of them got WSL without a problem. Uh, Mac is tough. Uh, if you have a Mac, you cannot do what we're going to do from Bash. Uh, on the command line. There is going to be problems. So if you choose to use a Mac, first of all, I think you should find another computer instead of using your Mac. But if you have to use a Mac, uh, your your best option is to install VirtualBox and Pop OS, which is jumping way ahead to how to use virtual machines. So if, if that's your choice, go for it. Uh, if you want to try to struggle through using uh, whatever your Apple, your Mac has on it, whether it's Z Shell or Bash or ancient, ancient Bash, 
that's your choice. But a lot of the stuff that we do uh, from here on out will not work because it's just incompatible with the GNU tools uh, and because it's using BSD and it's not even using Linux at all. Uh, so this again, this is a Linux boost. This isn't a free BSD boost. This isn't a Darwin boost. This isn't a Mac terminal boost. This is a Linux boost. Um, so Linux, if you have it, you already know how to use it. If you want to spend some time installing Alacrity, go for that. Again, I'm reviewing what you can do between now and tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> always too, yeah. Um, so uh, again, tomorrow we're going to try to get through. The main thing we need to do is get our terminal activated, connect it to GitLab and GitHub using SSH Keygen. There is a tutorial about SSH Keygen if you want to jump ahead and try to do this tonight or today. Um, we are going to write a shell script two shell scripts tomorrow. We're going to write a very simple. Uh, yes, it, if you look, if you. Uh, SSH keygen, you don't need SSH keygen in the store. You can just, once you have, if, you, if you're going to try to do this tonight, follow the WSL first. Okay. Uh, writing, yep, shell scripts in bash. So the, if you're going to try to do this tonight, follow the WSL. I cannot emphasize this enough. Follow this first. And then uh, you can maybe try to get SSH keygen and follow the steps for SSH keygen. Okay. Uh, we're going to go even one step further and we're going to enable uh, your keys. What you At the end of the day tomorrow, you will have a terminal that works with GitLab. That's what you'll have. And you'll have a couple shell scripts to help out. You'll have a save script that you might, just like we did with web today, you might not understand it all, but it'll give you an overview. It's a walkthrough of how to write your own save script so you don't have to run like eight Git commands to do it. And then we'll also, if we have time, uh, we'll do a little magic eight ball uh, shell script in bash to kind of get you, your, you know, give you a feel for bash scripting uh, and, you know, kind of have fun on the terminal. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun and easy to do. It's not too hard and it's kind of a get your feet wet kind of activity um, because they publish under a more restrictive license. Yeah, we're not going to even talk about that. Uh, uh yeah random quick question if statement if statement or case statements i i like both actually i like both i tend to be a case statement guy when i have it uh i think you're do you know some someone good to raid yes does anybody know that um uh, and this stream will be on youtube but it won't be on youtube until tomorrow uh within the next four hours people yesterday's stream will be on youtube within the next four hours uh, I am delayed. I'm on a 24 hour delay uh, because of the situation with affiliate for Twitch. I am not allowed to publish to YouTube and until 24 hours have passed. So there's always going to be a, a one, a 24 hour delay on the videos I'd make on YouTube. The page of essential apps on, can anyone help? Uh, I actually, it's still there. I think it's called essentials and, and um, I'm not, I kind of, I kind of, I'm, guys, it's um, the essentials. I, I skipped the essentials. Rate optional CTF. All right, just set, I actually skipped the essentials. Here we go. It's essentials right here. It doesn't have a link to it anymore because I didn't want to bar burden people with all the other stuff on there. Okay. We're going to get optional. We can get optional. Uh, okay. All right, people, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and raid optional and get that raid started. And um, we'll see you uh, tonight. I will be uh, tonight. I will be online for sure. Uh, but all I'm going to be doing is writing, uh, writing and listening to music. Um, if you and, and I'm not even going to be on voice or anything. Uh, if But if you just want to watch me using Markdown and VI and editing and just hang out and talk with other people, go for it. Uh, I don't, I'm not even going to have the chat visible. I check in with the chat every once in a while. But uh, if you just want to like be a fly on the wall and, and hang out, that, I'll be on for that. But that's about it. So, guys, take care. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream now. Um, so if there's no other questions, if there's any other questions, feel free to ask them in the Discord. you got a, a big old community to help you. Uh, and we'll see you later. That's what I do best. <laughs> All right, guys, take care. Twitch, stop.